Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I have sworn and I confirm to guard your righteous right rulings. I have been afflicted very much, O Yahweh. Revive me according to your word. Please accept the voluntary offerings of my mouth, O Yahweh, and teach me your right rulings. My life is in my hand continually, and your Torah I have not forgotten. The wrong have laid a snare for me, but I have not strayed from your orders. Your witnesses are my inheritance for ever, for they are the joy of my heart. I have inclined my heart to do your laws for ever to the end. Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Praise Yahweh for another wonderful Shabbat together. A new month, eighth month, and having had a wonderful seventh month of feasts, it's, it's nice to be camping away, but it is always nice to come back home, although some prefer to be staying away in the <laughs> camping situation. Hey, Henry, Henry. Yeah, so we praise our Master that we can continue to be steadfast in having the assurance of His presence with us and being a people that can rejoice in His presence. It's a, it really has been a, a wonderful, it's like, it's like the feast just came and went, you know, and it's just so nice to see. We were talking, a, a, you know, a little bit about all the, the seasons and the changes. I mean, we can see it's starting to get a little warmer here now, and I know uh, Renee was saying to me it's getting cold there now in Germany. So we're just seeing all these seasonal changes and also the agricultural witnesses that we get that confirm the declaration of the lights in the sky. I mean, the, the sowing and the planting that is already taking place in the land of Israel is another proof witness for us that our timing is correct, that they're already doing that, which is not typically done before Sukkot. So some, sadly, some of our brothers and sisters have been led a bit astray by rabbinic influence in terms of timing this year, but we pray that before our master comes that there will be a proper unity and, and uh, alignment in terms of our master's appointed times as he's given us to observe so we are journeying through Vaikra and come to Vaikra 21 through to 24, obviously highlights our appointments with our master, which we're going to look at. But before that, it's about, we've been looking at about how we draw near to the master, how we have been cleansed in him. And so this Torah portion teaches us, uh, following on from last week, about how we are to be set apart. It really is the emphasis, our set apartness and what that truly entails. And so as we continue through this book, it teaches us valuable lessons of what set-apartness means. And set-apart means set-apart. There is no compromise. There's no room for mixing. There's no room for tolerance of evil and tolerance of corrupt ways. Set-apart is set-apart. And I think that's the emphasis that we continue coming from our camping into back into our normal routine and into recognizing that there is no better way to live but to be set apart for our master. So let's get into it. Carol saying Shabbat Shalom, family. Jillian said earlier on Shabbat Shalom. She wakes up, sets her alarm at 2 a.m. in the morning. Praise Yahweh for that. I wake in the dawn with praise. And Cheryl saying rejoice in Torah. It's a set apart word. Shabbat Shalom to all. So nice to see our family online with us. And so let's get straight into it. Ricardo is ready there with Vaikra 21. And Yahweh said to Mose, Speak to the priest, the sons of Aaron, and say to them, No one is to be defiled for a debt among his people, except for his relatives who are nearest to him, for his mother, and for his father, and for his son, and for his daughter, and for his brother, and for his maiden sister who is near to him, who has had no husband, for her he is defiled. A leader does not defile himself among his people to profane himself. They do not make any bold places on their head, and they do not shave the corner of their beard, and they do not make a cutting in their flesh. They are set apart to their Elohim, and do not profane the name of their Elohim. For they bring the fire offerings of Yahweh, and the bread of their Elohim, and shall be set apart. They do not take a woman who is a war, or a fouled woman. And they do not take a woman put away from her husband, for he is set apart to his Elohim. And you shall set him apart, for he brings the bread of your Elohim, 
ye set apart to you, for I, Yahweh, setting you apart, am set apart. And when the daughter of any priest profanes herself by warring, she profanes her father, she is burned with fire. And the high priest among his brothers, who on whose head the anointing oil was poured, and who is ordained to wear the garments, does not unbind his head, nor tear his garments, nor come near any dead body, nor defile himself for his father or his mother, nor go out of the set apart place, nor profane the set apart place of his Elohim. For the sign of dedication of the anointing oil of his Elohim is upon him. I am Yahweh. And let him take a wife in her maidenhood, a widow or one put away, or a defiled woman, or a war, these he does not take, but a maiden of his own people he does take as a wife. And he does not profane his offspring among his people, for I am Yahweh, who sets him apart. And Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron, saying, No man of their offspring throughout the generations who has any defect is to draw near to bring the bread of his Elohim. For any man who has a defect is not to draw near, a man blind or one lame or disfigured or deformed, a man who has a broken foot or a broken hand, or is a hunchback or a dwarf, or a man who has a defect in his eye, or eczema, or a scab, or is a eunuch. No man among the offspring of Aaron and the priest who has a defect is to come near to bring the offerings made by fire to Yahweh. He has a defect, he does not come near to bring the bread of his Elohim. He does he does eat the bread of his Elohim, both the most set apart and the set apart. Only he does not go near the veil or approach the slaughter place, because he has a defect, unless he profanes my set apart places. For I am Yahweh, who sets them apart. Thus Moses spoke to Aaron and his sons, and to all the children of Israel. Okay, so let me just put my screen glare but down there. Okay, so this week's Torah portion is called Emor, which uh, means say or speak, and comes from the word Amar, which is utter, speak, or say something. And so what we see at the beginning of this Torah portion is further instructions that Moshe has given. And once again, he's commanded to speak to the priests, the sons of Aharon. Last week, we looked at how Moshe was commanded to speak to all the congregation of the children of Israel. And we looked at what it means to be set apart. And now the focus comes more to the priesthood and its service because that is what serves as the intercession between Yahweh and his set apart people. And so after being warned and forbidden to have any form of communication with the dead, they're now instructed not to even be defiled for the dead. And one thing that's quite clear here, to be defiled in Hebrew is the Hebrew word tameh, which means to become unclean, to be impure. It renders one unfit for service to draw near to Yahweh. And if there's no priest drawing near to Yahweh, there's no intercession for the children of Israel. So the focus here, as we look through this uh, a chapter on the priesthood, is about the pattern that Moshe was given on the mountain for the Levitical priesthood to perform in order for Yahweh's presence to be among his people. And as we know in the design of the tabernacle, which we're going to get to again as we go through the cycle, when we look at the encampments and how Moshe and Aharon um, were at the east, and then you had the sons of Aharon at the north, the west, and the south uh, as a almost like a barrier the, between the rest of the encampments on all four sides of the tabernacle. And so if the priesthood was defiled, then it rendered the rest of the nation unable to actually bring their offerings to Yahweh because it wouldn't be accepted. So when we look at this, we, we learn some valuable lessons going through this and who we are as a people in Messiah who is consistently and constantly interceding for us in the most set-apart place in the heavens because the service of the Levitical priesthood was always a shadow picture of that which is above. A perfect pattern it was supposed to be of that which reflects the true service in the heavenly tabernacle not built by the hands of man. And so when we look at this, we understand that without our master, we all have fallen short. And without him, we have no access to draw near. And Hebrews... The letter to the Hebrews also teaches us that, you know, Yahweh found fault with them. He's speaking of the Levitical, Levitical priesthood. And part of the fault finding was some of the things that they were doing here, being defiled for the dead, doing wrong ways, joining themselves, not keeping set apart, 
corrupting their worship, maybe even allowing that which is not allowed to bring the offerings to be brought, whether there was defects, etc. So because that's what part of the pattern that was not being lived out according to these clear instructions, because everything that Yahweh commanded Moshe to speak to Israel and to the priests was always with the focus on the pattern of per perfection and set-apartness, because that should reflect Yahweh. You know, and so when we look at this, the previous chapter ended with the clear instruction forbidding any communication with the dead, as mediums and spiritists were to be put to death. And so Devarim 18 tells us that no one in our midst should be found to be calling up the dead. So that's a clear no-no. I mean, we obviously know that. And there's many in the world that do these things. Even when we look at the pattern in Scripture of that medium that Shaul went to go and see after he put a ban in the land, but went to and calling up Shemuel from the dead. So we know that, you know, this is something that is not permitted for a set-apart people because it defiles that which Yahweh is given for a people to have his presence in their midst. And so any communication with the dead is prohibited. In the beginning of this chapter, he makes it abundantly clear that the priesthood must not be made unclean for the dead because the priesthood must represent Yahweh, which is life and abundant life. And that's what our master has come to give us, an abundant life in him. And that abundant life in him teaches us that as we stay in him, we must not be defiled for the dead in any way, mean, or form. And so the Torah represents for us life. Devarim tells us that the very words that we have received through Moshe from Yahweh is not worthless to us, but it is our life, you know? And we are called by our master to go and make taught ones of the nations. Now, while we are not all appointed to be teachers of the body, we are called to go and make taught ones or be teachers of the nations and to be instructors of the Torah as we reflect that in our own lives. Now, if our own lives are defective, how can we shine the light, that perfect light of set-apartness? And so here we also see to be defiled for the dead simply means to be the touching of the body of a dead person. So the priest was only allowed to be defiled. Remember, being defiled, you know, when we hear this, be defiled, there's permission for what one could be defiled for. In other words, it renders one unfit to draw near. And the only way or the only permissible reason for a priest to be defiled for the dead was a close relative, a father, a mother, a brother, a sister, you know, or a, a child. But outside of that, they could not be defiled for the dead. Because in ancient Israel, there wasn't uh, funeral services that one could call and deal with the dead bodies. And it was a responsibility of the direct families to take care of the, the burial. You know, and, and when we think about it, a, a dead corpse is nothing more than just flesh and bones with no nefesh, no life in it, no breath of life in it. And therefore it's defiled because it's got no life. It's got no breath, you know. And so one would become ritually unclean just by being in the same room as corpse. And so, as I said in ancient times, direct families would do it. They'd have to take care, the burial process of washing and wrapping the body in grave clothes. It would require a significant amount of touching. And so this is what a priest should not be doing except for direct family. So that was what was permissible for that. So the te that what we learn from this is that the Torah represents for us life. And the great caution that the priesthood must have at all times is to remain undefiled so that they can serve the entire community of Israel. And therefore, the only exception would be that close relative, which would exclude them from duties. Now, there were other priests that would still perform the duties in the tabernacle, so the tabernacle would still have its functioning service, or it should was supposed to, you know. And so we also remember when Aharon was being set apart, him and his sons, and after the seven days, remember when they now went into service, and Nadav and Avihu profaned their worship, and Aharon was told to not unbind the uh, turban from his head, and he was not to stop his performance in what he was required to be doing in the set-apart place as high priest, let others come and take their bodies away. 
you know. And so we understand this, that this was a clear picture. He was not allowed to mourn for them because he was in service. And so this is a reflection of the pattern of the tabernacle of our master who continually intercedes for us, you know. And him who knew no sin became sin for us. He took away that sin, so he consistently is in the set-apart place interceding for us. And so we understand the power that we have in our master for us to be without excuse from defilement. Now, when we see there's a literal instruction here on physical bodies that die and, you know, etc., and renders one unclean, fit for, unfit for service in the tabernacle, we also understand the metaphorical and prophetic nature that it carries as a body in Messiah, that we must guard ourselves from becoming defiled with the dead. Now, when we see that on a prophetic level, we also understand that those that aren't walking in the Torah have no life in themselves. So in many ways, it's like the walking dead. So we are not to align or join ourselves with dead works because our master has redeemed us from dead works in order to serve the living Elohim. And therefore, we should not get defiled by touching or engaging with that that does not represent life, not being unequally yoked and being where we should not be, you know. And so in, we come to last week we looked at the instructions given to the entire nation, and here now, as I said, now it turns with focus to the priesthood because if the priesthood get it wrong, the rest are going to get it wrong kind of thing. You know, it's like the blind following the blind danger. And so verses 4 to 5 further stipulates that a leader must not defile himself among his people to profane himself, not cut any bald spots on their head, not to shave the corners of their beards, nor cut themselves. Now, as we know, this was part of ritual practices for mourning for the dead by what the nations were doing. But we looked last week at the whole beard and the cutting and the tattoos. But now it's coming here with a clear witness of, what a, the leader shouldn't be doing in terms of in the mourning for the dead. So here we see last week we were looking at entire nation. This week we're looking at that which defiles one for the dead. Did you want to share something? No? And so to profane something means to treat it with as common or to defile or to wound or to kill and to treat it with abuse irreverence or contempt. And isn't that what most people are doing today? They're profaning worship unto Yahweh, just as Nadav and Avi who brought strange fire, they, they brought profaned fire, you know. Um, Jillian is saying, yeah, at every funeral I always hear people saying, I will miss you. You know, well, I don't know who they're talking to, but we certainly do miss those that have passed. But we also understand that some of the customary things that are centered around the way the world does funerals is not necessarily a scriptural thing. There's nothing wrong in having a remembrance of those loved that have fallen asleep and with the hope that we will see them when we, we are all changed in a twinkling of an eye or awoken in the first resurrection. But certainly to be speaking to them or to, you know, there's this thing that people do. They think that they, their loved ones are watching from heaven or, you know, when you die, you sleep. And many people misinterpret the writings of it, what Hebrew says, that we have a cloud of witnesses. They think it's those loved ones that are, you know, it doesn't matter. They were terrible people, but they're sitting in the heaven. You know, what kind of a heaven is that, if you ask me, you know? What we understand is that when... Yeah, that you have to look down on earth and see all the rubbish that's going on, you know. So when you die, you sleep and there's no talking to the dead, you know. There's no, because that's calling up from the dead. You know, this is, this is something that the world does and they deem it as being acceptable, but that's not a reality, you know. And so when we look at a leader here in this chapter, the leader is also not limited only to the priesthood, although here Aaron and his sons are being spoken to. We also take note that leader is the head of a home. A husband who's expected to lead his family according to the instructions of the Torah and not found to be doing as the nations do. Some of the practices of cutting one's flesh, shaving one's head, we spoke a little bit about that last week. So, you know, we see in typical customs, even in African cultures, where they cut off parts of their hands and limbs, you know, to mourn for the dead. I mean, this is ridiculous, but that is what the nations do. And Yahweh says, I don't want you doing what the nations do. Because what they do is profanity, you know. It's not representing life. I once again 
want to make it clear that we are to make sure that we're staying to the true set-apart standards that our Master's given us in His Word to be a set-apart people that are not defiled in any way for service unto Him. And many people today, just by their lives in what they're engaging in on a spiritual level, is a defilement of the Spirit. Remember, Shaul says we must cleanse our lives from all defilement of spirit and flesh. So that's why I said we can see the literal command in terms of our living out in, in fleshly ways, in, in, in the flesh of, of man. And we also see what it means to be walking according to the Spirit, because people are doing spiritual defilement in the way they worship and are including the dead to be part of this practice in many ways. And, and as I said earlier, joining hands in worship with people who aren't walking in the Torah is a picture of defiling oneself spiritually with the dead because they have no life. Because if you don't have the spirit of Yahweh in you, you have no life in you. Because that life that you had is decaying. It's death. Because when man sins, the punishment of that sin is death. Dying, you shall die. It's a decaying process. So we have to understand how serious Yahweh is about us retaining life. Because when we get immersed in, in the name of Yahushua, we die to the old, we're resurrected in the resurrection power and life of our master, we have a renewal taking place. We have a recovery of breath, and we are to breathe in the fear of Yahweh so that we guard our set-apartness and not touch that which is unclean, so that we have the assurance that he will receive us. If we are engaging in dead matters, we risk being rejected by him rather than being accepted by him, you know? And so I don't know if we need to touch more on set apart. Last week we looked at Kedoshim, so I don't really need to touch more on that. It should still be fresh in our minds. But verse 7 speaks of how marriage should be held in the highest regard, especially for the priesthood. A priest was not allowed to marry a whore or a woman who was defiled or one who had been put away by her husband. And marriage is a picture of a union between Yahweh as creator and his chosen bride as the created. You know, this is the mystery that Shaul speaks of, or the secret, the mysterium in Greek, you know. And every single marriage has the ability or should have the ability to represent the true marriage between a creator and his created, you know. And so when we see this, call for the priest should not be joined or in marriage to a whore. The Hebrew word for whore is zana, which means to be a harlot, commit fornication, adulterous, prostitute, unfaithful, untrustworthy. And this is a very clear call for all true set-apart believers as a body of Messiah to not be joined to a whore. While this is a literal command, we also see the clear metaphor of not being joined to following the luring ways of a sinful world and be corrupted by the wicked temptation of the whore that is spoken of in Chazan. You know, Mishle 23 verse 27 says, For a whore is a deep pit, and a strange woman a narrow well. Verse 29 verse 3 says, He who loves wisdom gladdens his father, but a companion of whores destroys wealth. You know, when you join yourself to that which is adulterous in terms of spiritual matters, which is unfaithful, or lacking belief, because without belief, no one can see the master. And we know that those in the wilderness that did not enter into the promised land, it was because of unbelief, because they didn't obey. So disobedience is coupled with the idea of unbelief, where belief is coupled with obedience to his Torah. So when you join yourself or are a companion of whores, those that lack belief because they don't obey, you're destroying wealth, and the richest thing we can be is to know Yeshua Messiah because he's given us all that we need for life and reverence. So when we are a companion, which means it's more than just a passing by, you know, we are going to deal with people in this world because we're to be a light to the nations, but a companion speaks of interaction. It speaks of doing more than just being a light to them and showing them how they should walk, it's engaging with them in what they do. And a companion with those that don't align themselves with the truth destroys the wealth of the word that's in you. 
That redemption that we receive is worth far more than gold and silver and rubies. But we can quickly get destroyed when you are a companion of whoring or for those who whore. And corrupt company or what's it? Evil company corrupts good character. Tehillah 73 verse 27 says, For look, those who are far from you perish. You shall cut off all those who go whoring away from you. So recognizing that we are to be a faithful, trustworthy body of Messiah, we recognize as a bride unto our master, we must remind ourselves who we've been joined to by his blood and therefore live appropriately and according to the way we are called to, and that is to be set apart. You know, a wife of a priest is also in, in part of the instructions that Shaul gives to Timotheus is to be reverent, not false accusers, sober and trustworthy in every way. Again, part of the pattern of how we are to be that capable wife that Mishle 31 gives us as an acrostic poem of the set-apart bride of our Creator. Hosea was told to do the very exact opposite. The very exact. Does that sound right? <laughs> you know, of this command. Now remember, Hosea was a herdsman from Tekoa. He wasn't a priest. But Yahweh took him because the priesthood was defiled, and he called Hosea to be a prophet, you know. And he says, I'm talking about Amos. Sorry, uh, sorry, let me get my bearings right. Amos was a herdsman from Tekoa. Sorry about that. Let me retract. Hosea was called to go and marry a whore. So he was told to do the opposite to what we see being instructed here, but not taking a whore as a wife. Now, Why? Because he was a witness. You know, Yahweh used his prophets to witness the depravity of their, I mean, Yechezkel was told to pull out his beard and to burn half of it. He was told to lie on his side. He was told to make a siege against Jerusalem and, you know, to do these witnesses, make a hole in the wall, crawl through it with his baggage, you know, and somebody should ask what you're doing and nobody asked. You know, so he'd have to, then a lot of his prophets had to, Yeshiyahu had to have his, you know, his, his pants, or his garments a bit torn so, you know, he could see, you know, it's almost like could see his buttocks for a couple of years walking around because it was to their shame, you know. Hosea was told to go marry a whore because this would show how serious the spiritual, spiritual condition of Israel was in. It's only by the blood of Messiah that can cleanse all our unrighteousness. And so by his blood... He's cleansed for himself a bride that was defiled because we've all sinned and fallen short of the esteem of Yahweh because through the one man, all men have sinned. And only those who have been washed in our master's blood through immersion in water, not by the cutting off of the foreskin or anything else, but through immersion in his name. That's when a bride can be added to as she grows by those calling on the master and being raised from death to life through his resurrection power and the cleansing that he brings through his one-time sacrifice for all who call upon him and are washed through water to receive that cleansing and receive the deposit of the set-apart spirit, giving us entrance to actually eat of the Pesach meal in many ways representing the set-apart bread that we are now permitted to eat because of our master who has no defect, you know. What we also realize and can learn from this is that, you know, often people when they look at this and they think, okay, but are we allowed to marry someone who has defiled themselves before marriage? Now, what we must take note is that a person's past does not, if being cleansed in the master, it does not, the old is gone. So when one comes, what we are saying is don't go and join yourself to somebody as a believer with an unbeliever. But if there is an unbeliever that becomes a believer, what they did in unbelief is forgotten, it's washed, it's moved away. They are now new in Messiah. And therefore, it's permissible to be joined in marriage as a new convert in, in many ways. Does that make sense? You know? What we do take note of is that Yahweh takes marriage seriously. It's that mystery that the whole scripture is all about, from beginning to end. It's about a husband and a bride 
waiting to be together forever and the necessary preparation that has been made for that to happen. That, in a nutshell, is the good news. Because man was separated from his creator because of sin. And the destruction of that sin made it impossible for a creator to dwell with his created in the perfection of set apartness, and therefore he had to redeem a corrupted man back to himself by the perfect witness and the perfect sacrifice of his own life in the form of flesh, but knowing no corruption. That is the good news. And he did it all because he loves us. And he did it all because of the institution of marriage that he was always a reflection of his desire to be with his creation forever. There are so many today who have entered into a marriage that is or has become unequally yoked for various reasons. And Shaul gives these commands or these instructions when this happens. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, it says, To the married I command. Now remember, Shaul was going out to the nations. So when people were receiving this good news, some people were already married in the state that they were in before that anyone knew the good news. So we must understand context. So he says, To the married I command, not I, but the master. A wife shall not separate from a husband. Because what he's saying here, okay, now you've got the good news. It doesn't mean now you've got license to just say it was null and void. That's what he's saying. He says, but if she is indeed separated, let her remain unmarried to all be restored to favor with her husband and let her husband not send away a wife. And to the rest I say, not, I, rest I say, not the master. If any brother has an unbelieving wife, unbelieving wife and she thinks well to live with him, let him not send her away. And a woman who has an unbelieving husband and he thinks well to live with her, let her not send him away. For the unbelieving husband has been set apart in the wife and the unbelieving wife has been set apart in the husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but now they are set apart. And if the unbelieving one separates, let him separate himself. A brother or a sister has not been enslaved in such matters, but Elohim has called us to peace. For how do you know, O wife, whether you shall save your husband? Or how do you know, O husband, whether you shall save your wife? These are rhetorical questions. You can't save your husband and wife. But what he is saying is that when it says the wife is separated for the husband, the husband, what it's saying is it doesn't mean the unbeliever is set apart. It's in the construct of the home that the believing one brings Yahweh's presence to cover the children that they can learn the right ways to live and that the children are not defiled but are set apart. It doesn't mean that there's license to continue in, I was going to say, unset apartness or defilement or profanity. But what he is saying here, this isn't a license that, oh, no, now I've come to belief, my husband or my wife hasn't come to the belief, so now kick them out. He's saying, no, 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 you don't know. You, first of all, you can't say it, but your witness should be there in the home. Now, if the unbeliever wants to separate themselves, then let them go. But you, we are called to live at peace. Did you want to show so, something? You have to tell them to be tend to want to blame the unbeliever for what's happening in the house. Yes. So if you live a set apart life, you can bless your house in spite of the unbeliever mm -hmm. living there. So that you don't have to live under the curses yes. that that person's actions might bring. Yeah. I think that's what that means is to how you know you set apart yes. in that sense. Yeah. That Yahweh looks to the believer's life. Yes. But I mean that's why he it is difficult because if you are unequally yoked, Yahweh does discipline the other person yeah. and it will affect you. I mean, we all get affected by other people's choices who we are connected to in our lives. Yes, that is true. And I think what Shaul was basically saying, he said, look, when you come to the belief and you're not married, don't go and find one who's not in the belief. That's a clear, that's obvious. But when a family who is already married, has children, now somebody comes to belief, whether the husband or the wife. That's what Shaul is addressing. He says, no, it's not, don't go and now break up the home for the sake of the one that's confessed the master. He will still bring his shalom into that home and there doesn't need to be war. Do your best to live at peace, but don't compromise, but don't compromise is the clear witness. Now, through one not compromising, it might cause the unbelieving one to say, I want to leave. Well, then let them leave. That's, that's what Shaul is teaching here. You know, 
the other, there's warnings here again about the whoring of a daughter of a priest is, uh, um, when she's defiled. And again, this is about children. So here we see Shaul is teaching Torah in many ways about the household and how we retain shalom in the household, you know. And our master takes the role of headship of the home and leadership in the community seriously. Because even the priest's children were to live set-apart lives. I mean, that's obvious, because everything that we see in the Torah is always in the context of a mother and a father teaching the Torah, and children respecting that and listening and obeying it, always in the context of that. Now, when parents are not keeping the Torah, that's another thing that we that, that's dealt with in Scripture as well. But one of the things that we see here, looking at Hosea, when we see the picture of the daughter when he had children and the daughter that was born to him who went and took a whore, the daughter was called Lo Ruchama, which means not loved or have no compassion and represents the daughters of whoring who are called to strive with their mother and come out from her, remove the name of Baals from their lips, call upon Yahweh, as her husband, and he will take her who had no compassion and that was not loved, and she'll be loved. Because the book of Hosea is literally a parable and a prophetic parable lived out through his life as a witness to Ephraim. Israel, who was divorced and whore because of whoring and scattered through the nations, yet Yahweh saying, the one who I've shown no compassion to, I will have compassion upon, because that's why he came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel, in order to die for her and be raised in order to take her back unto himself, the one who was not loved, to be the beloved. Isn't that a wonderful picture of the redemption of our master, the good news that we are, are to be proclaiming, that we can have now through our whoring, in the wrong ways, because we've all sinned. You know, when we say, I didn't whore, of course. David said in sin, my mother conceived me, because it's not that she did a whoring act to have David. It means that through the first Adam, we are all born in this flesh that needs to be redeemed. And so when we see this good news that Hoshea proclaims, one um, among many things, go read the entire book, because you need to read it at, in a, in a session to get the fullness of it, is that what is Ephraim to do with idols? It's a rhetorical question. You should be done with it. You should be done with idol worship. You should be done with whoring because our masters provided a way for once, for we who were once not a people of Elohim and without him in this world, Shaul tells us this in Ephesians, but have now been brought near by his blood. We who were once the unloved because of whoring, are now loved in order to be properly set apart and no longer whore and profane our lives to the one who called us out of darkness, you know? And so Aaron was also commanded, the high priest was ordained to wear garments, the anointing oil was poured on his head, he was not allowed to unbind his head or tear his garments. Now the Hebrew word for unbind is para, which means to let go, let alone, lack of restraint, uncover, neglect, out of control. I'm mentioning this because it's translated as let loose. When Moshe saw the people were let loose because Aharon let them loose. Now this was, you know, obviously still under the pressure of the people. This was the golden calf incident. While Moshe was getting the commands from Yahweh, he comes back and, you know, under the pressure, you know, you know Aharon's witness before he was actually properly ordained was, oh, I just threw it in the fire and it popped out. Meanwhile, he shaped us. He did what the people wanted. Aharon learned a valuable lesson then. This is a picture of the compassion of Yahweh, because Aharon had not yet been given instructions for the high priest, so Yahweh still had compassion, brought them out, and it's like many of us coming out of a corrupt system, and sometimes we find those things that we shouldn't be doing. It doesn't mean that we have a license to do it, because Yahweh will say it's okay. We must learn from the pattern of Scripture that Yahweh demands set apartness. And how many of us can truly say that we're sitting here today because of Yahweh's compassion on us? We who didn't have compassion, we're sitting here because of his compassion. But that doesn't give us license to live as ones without compassion because, oh, he'll just accept me. We have to take serious the cleansing 
that's been brought. And with the high priest commanded not to unbind or let loose the turban, we think of who we are as a body of Messiah who is in this most set-apart place in the heavens. So the, the turban on the high priest, remember, it had the gold plate that was on it that said set apart to Yahweh. So part of unbinding that turban would let go of set apartness, which is a theme that we're seeing going through Vaikra at the moment. So as a body of Messiah, we should not unbind and let loose our lives to loose living and discard the need to be set apart. And that means, again, in terms of the armor of Elohim, we should not take our, off the helmet of deliverance. You know, as we see all the different pictures of who we are in the Master, because as long as we are in the Master, we are to be set apart. And being outside the Master, we should never be. So therefore, we should also never unbind our ability to be meditating on the Torah day and night and renewing our minds and not being conformed to the pattern of this world. Because we are, as Kepha reminds us, a chosen race, a royal pe a priesthood, a set-apart nation, a people for a possession, so that we should proclaim the praises of him who's called us out of darkness into his marvelous light, who were once not a people, but now the people of Elohim, who had not obtained compassion, but now obtained compassion. Beloved ones, I appeal to you as pilgrims and sojourners, to abstain from fleshly lusts which battle against the life, having your behavior among the nations good, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, let them, by observing your good works, esteem Elohim in a day of visitation. And I know it's a passage we're all familiar with, but it's, it's good to familiarize ourselves in the context of the Torah that we're learning again today. You know? So we should not whore. We should not join ourselves to whoring. We should guard ourselves against corruption of the flesh. We should not take off the Torah. We should not take off set apartness. And so with a clear picture of the state of the people of, that were let loose in our own actions of golden calf incident, it showed that in, as a nation they were left without a covering. They were naked and lacked restraint. They followed after the flesh because what they learnt from their enslavement in Mitzrayim. And while Aharon seemed to be keeping the peace in the camp because, you know, allowing them to do what they want actually turned out to be the reality, reality of him not standing up for what is right. And so many people fall into that trap today. They prefer to keep quiet for the sake of peace. Whose peace? It's not Yahweh's peace. And this we can't do. We must stand up for the truth and guard it in our lives, not allowing breach to come into the camp, so to speak. You know, at the time of the trial of Yehoshua, high priest Caiaphas tore his garments, and he declared that Messiah had blasphemed, and by his actions, Caiaphas broke this very Torah that we're looking at today in many ways. And what becomes clear is that Caiaphas might have actually been an illegitimate high priest because the, the, the high priest, according to the order from Aharon, was always to be sons of Aharon. It should have passed down through a lineage. And what we see here, at the time of Messiah, the position was often given to the highest bidder because the Romans controlled and had authority over the temple and would appoint who they wanted. And therefore, tearing the garments of the high priest is a powerful picture of the beginning of the change of priesthood from the Levitical that Yahweh found fault with in, to that which is in Messiah, the order of Melchizedek, which the book of Hebrews deals with. And so we are further told that the high, that the high priest was not to come near any dead body or, or defile himself for a father or mother. And then we understand that the words of, my, of our master when someone came to him, one of his taught ones, you know, came to him and wanted to go bury his father. And our master said to him, let the dead bury the dead. Now, well, we have to understand context, you know. What we see here, this taught one that was asking this was not that his father had just died. It was that he wanted to go and stay at home, wait for his father to die, which could have still been a long time so that he could get inheritance. And when he's got, once he's got inheritance, then he can follow the master. And Yeshua was identifying with his heart because this one who desired to follow Messiah 
in his heart, first wanted to make sure that I'm covered. You know, yes, I'll let go of everything, but I've got to make sure I'm stable. You know, and that's why he said, let the dead bury the dead. It, you know, and so when we understand that being a member of the body of the high priest, we also must be on guard against becoming defiled for our natural relatives. This means that we, when we follow the master and serve him in spirit and truth, we must count the cost and realize we can't go back to old ways and try to hold on to the things that can cause us to be unfit and render us as not set apart, you know. Again, the instruction that was given to not go out of the set-apart place and not profane the name of, name of Elohim because the, the sign of dedication, which was the sign on his turban set apart to Yahweh, was on his head. And therefore, this reminds us who we are in Messiah, that we are never to not be set apart. I know you used two negatives there, but for good reason. Because we are never to not be set apart. We must be continually set apart as we hear God and do his instructions without compromise. His sign of dedication to him is upon us. And that sign that he's given to us as a sign between us and him is his Sabbath. You know? And we've seen today how one's own family may call for a set-apart believer to compromise the Sabbath or any of the other commands, because, you know, the Sabbath, we've always said, is the, you know, the entrance into our master's reign or into him as his body is immersion in his name. And then the Sabbath becomes that markable sign upon us as we come every week to hear what Moshe is saying. So we learn what set apartness means and we guard the Sabbath completely. So we never find ourselves compromising when we're walking out as lights before others. But often family members of set-apart believers, family members that aren't set-apart, often call for them to take that sign of dedication off. You know, by breaking the Sabbath for a family event or a crisis, or in doing so, they call for the set-apart ones to take off that dedicated sign that marks them as set-apart and suddenly become common. And this we have to guard against. You know, don't take the sign of dedication to the master off of you. Because when you give in to compromising on the Sabbath and the feasts, which includes then as a stepping stone for any of the commands of Elohim, you're taking set apartness off and you leave yourself naked and exposed. And the shame of your sin stands exposed without a covering. And that's not a place that we want to be in. You know, the rest of the chapter gives clear instructions of how we, as his kingdom, are to be found spotless in Messiah, in whom there's no defect or deformity. Once again, this pictures for us the wonderful work of our master, our Passover perfect lamb, who has enabled us to draw near to Elohim. No offspring of Aharon, who had a defect, was to draw near to Elohim and bring the required offerings. He could eat the bread, the set-apart bread, but they couldn't bring the, the offerings. A son without a defect can eat, but not allowed to bring it near. This is, again, a picture of how we, too, have, as I said, been found to have defects because we've all sinned and fallen short due to the sinful nature, unable to draw near in our own strength. However, as we partake of the bread of Elohim in Messiah, we are brought near as we remain in him, our perfect high priest. This is what the pattern of the Levitical priesthood was always proclaiming of the coming good matters. So without understanding the perfection of the service that's called for, we can never truly understand that gift that we've been given in the master. And when we understand that gift, according to this perfect pattern, we will take serious our position in the master and not compromise. You know, I think sometimes people let loose too easily, give in to compromise too easily because they don't understand. Their mind thinks Levitical pattern, don't need it, it's old. But when we understand this pattern was always a pattern that was shown to Moshe on the mountain and how it reflects the perfection of Yahweh. So when we see this and how it was supposed to be that Yahweh found fault with it, but it was always not with the pattern, not with the service, but with the people doing it. 
And therefore he came himself to show the perfect way. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And therefore in him, we're still following this pattern because the pattern never changed. It's just the order in which we live it has changed because it's now in the order of Melchizedek and not in the Levitical priesthood. But the pattern is still the, the, the functional way of being set apart and drawing near to the master. And we're given clear instruction of who is able to draw near to bring the bread of his Elohim. And this emphasizes for us the need for the redemptive and atoning work of our Messiah through whom we've been given access. For without his blood, we have no access. And the root word that's translated as defect is mum. It means defect, blemish, stain, spot. And it represents both a physical defect as well as a moral stain. This is used five times. Mum is used five times between verse 7 and 23, and is translated as defect in the, in the scriptures. What we also take note of is there's another word in this chapter that's translated as defect, and that is in verse 20, and that is the Hebrew word tevalul, which means defect, as in a defect in vision. It also means confusion and obscurity. So again, it's the inability to see correctly. That's really what it highlights. It comes from the root verb balal, which means to mingle, confi uh, confix, confound, or mix. Please, I'm not trying to mix my words there. <laughs> you know? So this makes sense. Because when one is mixing standards, your eyesight is defective. Because you're not looking to the prince and perfecter of our belief. You're looking to all different sources, and then you tevalul. You've become defective in your sight. That's what we see Yeshiyahu being told when he prophesied, of people seeing but not seeing, because they've become defective in their called-for perfect sight in the Master. This is a clear restriction on who is able to draw near to Elohim, and, who, and it's not a cruel command, but it's, it sets a distinction between those who are serving and those who are not. It's, that's what at the end of the uh, revelation of Messiah, Yochanan was told to now go proclaim this revelation. And then he, it was a clear separation. The one who's set apart, let him be more set apart. The one who's unclean, let him be more unclean. There's a, now the revelation has been completely announced and revealed. Who's serving, who's not? There's no gray areas with Yahweh. You either serve in perfection of set apartness, or you compromise, and even that slightest compromise, like that one drop of dirt into a glass of clean water defiles the water, that's what happens. That one stain, that one spot defiles the garments of covering and renders one as unfit because they didn't keep their garments clean. So all the parables and metaphors and pictures we see in Scripture is all about understanding that we need His covering because we were all defective and unable to draw near. But in the covering and the robes of righteousness that he has given us, we are now learning what that perfection of service entails by not taking off and letting loose the dedication that we are to have unto our master. Verse 18 to 20 expands on what is considered as a defect, and we're told not, that no blind, lame, disfigured, deformed, may draw near. Even if a man had a broken foot or hand, he was not permitted to draw near. Now you must understand, if, a, if, a, if somebody had a broken hand or broken foot on a practical level and they're trying to bring an offering near, you know, they're restricted. So that doesn't reflect perfection. So that's why it sounds cruel, but it's always to reflect what we have in the Master. It's not cruel. It's, you see, when Israel were defective in their worship and Yahweh made clear the standard. They said Yahweh's unfair. But Yahweh says, is it he that's unfair? Isn't they who are unfair when they are breaking worship? In other words, becoming deformed in the pattern and trying to render unto Yahweh in a deformed way? It's not acceptable. So everything that Yahweh gives us is always about the perfection of set apartness, right down to the smallest detail, teaching us that in Messiah we have no license to be defective. Did you want to share something? Also, if you do have an impediment, yes. it would make the job more difficult. Yes. So, 
I don't see it as cruel. I also see it as a that person doesn't have to feel forced now yes. to perform a task that so would be more difficult. Yeah. But they still can eat of the set apart bread. You know? And so one of the things that we see here, um, the Hebrew word that's translated as, as blind, iver, and the word lame is pesiach, comes from pasach, which means to limp or hesitate. And it's from this root word that we get pasach, to limp or hesitate or leap, that we get the word pesach, which passes over. So if you think it limps but also leap, then you understand the picture of Passover. So our master becomes our Passover lamb. Because in his blood, the perfect lamb who takes away the sins of the world has passed over our defects and covered us who have partaken in him. And those that are not in him, he's not going to pass over. He's going to pass through. He's going to destroy. And so our master makes it clear what the standard of set-apartness is. The, the Hebrew word um, for disfigured is haram. And for deformed is sara, which means to extend, stretch, overgrown, or be deformed. And we know that there are some tribal t traditions today that stretch the neck of women with iron bands or wire bands as a form of worship and identity. And it's clearly prohibited in Scripture because this would render one as not able to draw near. So there's all these cultural worship things that are done which renders one, according to the pattern, very clearly no. You don't do what the nations do. So all of this about this being deformed, because there's an, you can be, people are born deformed, but then there's some worship practices out there that are physically deforming themselves as a product of their incorrupt worship to whatever they're worshipping, or their corrupt worship, sorry, to whatever they're worshipping. And so one of the things that we understand is the, Hebrew, the Greek word that's translated as defect is momos. And remember we said mum, now the Greek, obviously from that, but making it masculine, momos. It means blemish, disgrace, insult of, um, it, it highlights a disgrace to society. And even in the Greek text, to, to have a defect would be shunned in the many ways, you know. And the word is only used once in the renewed writings when speaking of a term that's used in the concrete sense of false teachers. So while we're saying that the ones with defect couldn't draw near, but they could eat of the bread, when we look at this word, we see what Kepha's warning us against. Because if a teacher is defective, how are the learners going to be? You know? You know, it's like the blind leading the blind, the defective leading the defective, so to speak. And so what we are seeing here, these false teachers, we see in 2 Peter or Kephabet chapter 2, it says, speaking of these false teachers that he warns us against, he says, these like natural unreasoning beasts, having been born to be caught and destroyed, blaspheme that which they do not know, shall be destroyed in their destruction, being about to receive the wages of unrighteousness, <laughs> deeming indulgence in the day of pleasure, spots and blemishes, momos, reveling in their own deceptions while they feast with you. Wow. Now this was written to believers. And he was saying, watch out for those dogs. Watch out for those mutilators of the flesh, as Shoal says. Watch out for those who are reveling in their own deceptions. And so we understand here that our master came to give us away. But here's a wonderful thing as well. When our master came, we see a powerful witness here. He came healing the lame and the blind. He was, he was revealing to the crowds that he is the Savior and Elohim that Scripture prophesied of. Blind receive sight, lame walk, lepers are cleansed, deaf hear, dead are raised up, and poor are brought the good news. This is what Messiah told the taught ones of Yochanan to go report to him in prison what they saw so that Yochanan could be comforted as the one that prepared the way. Here he is, the lamb that takes away the sins of the world. And so when he came, with him coming to heal the lame and the blind, he, this is a wonderful thing that would anyone who believed in him could be strengthened and filled with great shalom because now there's access to draw near to Elohim, in him. 
And here, those that have anxious heart are told to be strong because the recompense of Elohim is with us. And with vengeance, he's coming to save us. You know, and so when we understand what we, are, what we have in the Master and how we are to draw near to him in complete set-apartness and truth, we've looked at the beginning of Vaikra, all the offerings and what it represents. We've seen what it means to draw near. We have, by the blood of Messiah, our ability to draw near to the throne of favor in our time of need. But we understand as we go through Vaikra, this is not a lawless license to just come to Elohim and demand what we want, which is what many people do. You know, we often think people that aren't even religious and then they offer up prayers. Who are you praying to? Isn't it you seem to want to pray when you want something? And our master makes it very clear that to the wrong, he says, why do you even recite my laws and take my name on your lips? You know, I don't hear you. But we are given the assurance in the renewed writings that Yahweh knows those who are his. And he hears the prayer of the righteous. So those that are receiving their wages of unrighteousness, in other words, they're disregarding the word, Yahweh doesn't hear them. And so one of the things that we take note of this chapter is it highlights complete set-apartness. It highlights the role of the priesthood and more specifically the role of the high priest, which we are in Messiah, and therefore teaches us the pattern that we still maintain is that Despite our insufficiencies in the flesh, he has come and equipped us to partake of him by eating of his body, that is Pesach meal, and by doing so we can partake of the set-apart matters. And as we're clothed in Messiah, let's never take Messiah off. Because when we take Messiah off and try and do it in our own strength, we are rendered as unworthy to be drawing near. And so we can only draw near by the clear standard of perfection of set-apartness that our Master has given us, clothed us in, in the righteousness that he's put upon us, and therefore we celebrate the fact that we can actually draw near and not be defiled because he's cleansed our conscience from dead works and he's cleansed our def us from all defilement of the flesh and spirit so that when we understand we must cleanse ourselves, we use the word to make sure that we are not picking up the spots and stains and blemishes of corruption of flesh and spirit. Any thoughts on this chapter? Gillian is asking, how should parents deal with a rebellious 18-year-old in the home that can't afford to move out? Well, 18 years old... You know, they're already of an age. We, we, we'll get to that part in, I think it's in Bermuda somewhere, I can't exactly remember where, where it talks about a wayward son. You know, you know this isn't a, a, a child that's in, it's still learning that you can discipline with the rod and, you know, don't let that hurt today. You know, it's like, you know, one of the guys was telling me at the gym the other day, an old guy, he says, do you have children? I said, no, my children are all grown. He says, yeah, I'm so glad we don't have small children. He says, I mean, he's in the world, and his words were to me, yeah, if he had children today, he'd probably be locked up <laughs> because of how to discipline and how the world doesn't want you to discipline. So when it comes to an 18-year-old, we all know, I know 20 years old is the fighting age in Scripture, but we're talking here even in worldly standards, 18 years old, you've kind of finished school, you should be able to be making your own choices. If that child is still going to live with you, then he submits to the rules of the house. If he doesn't, he's out. Yes, otherwise, as Colleen says, the mic's off there, you're enabling him, you know. And we are not to enable rebellious standard of living. Guard the shalom in our home. If he doesn't want to submit to Yahweh's standards that are lived out in the home, then he has no place in that home. It's a reflection of Yahweh saying, I don't know you, out you go into the darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. So in other words, if he doesn't want to light, live in the light of Yahweh's presence, then he must go out into the thick, darkened world where there is a lot of weeping and gnashing of teeth. You know? So... Discipline is necessary. And an 18-year-old son who's not submitting, go make his own way. That's it. I mean, I don't know how much she is agreeing. That's the way to go. So, Okay, chapter 22.
And Yahweh spoke to Moshe, saying, Speak to Aharon and his sons, that they separate themselves from the set-apart offerings of the children of Israel, and that they do not profane my set-apart name in what they set apart to me. I am Yahweh. Say to them, Any man of all your offspring throughout your generations who draws near to the set-apart offering, who draws near the set-apart offerings which the children of Israel set apart to Yahweh, while he has uncleanness upon him, that being shall be cut off from before me. I am Yahweh. Any man of the offspring of Aharon who is a leper or has a discharge does not eat the set-apart offerings until he is clean. And whoever touches what is rendered unclean by a being or a man who has an emission of semen or a man who touches any swarming creature by which he would be made unclean or any being by whom he would become unclean, even any of his uncleanness, the being who has touched it shall be unclean until evening, and does not eat the set-apart offerings, but shall bathe his body in water. And when the sun goes down, he shall be clean, and afterward eat the set-apart offerings, because it is his food. He does not eat that which dies, or is torn by beasts, becoming unclean by it. I am Yahweh. And you shall guard my, cho my charge, lest they bear sin for it, and die thereby when they profane it. I, Yahweh, set them apart. And no stranger eats the set-apart offering. A sojourner with a priest or a hired servant does not eat the set-apart offering. But when the priest buys a being with his silver, he does eat of it. The one, and one who is born in his house does eat his food. And when a priest's daughter is married to a stranger, she does not eat of the set-apart offerings. But when a priest's daughter is a widow or put away and has no child and has returned to her father's house, as in her youth, she does eat her father's food, but no stranger eats of it. And when a man eats the set-apart offering by mistake, then he shall give a set-apart offering to the priest and add one-fifth to it. And let the priests not profane the set-apart offerings of the children of Israel, which they lift up to Yahweh, or allow them to bear the crookedness of trespass, when they eat their set-apart offerings, for I am Yahweh who sets them apart. And Yahweh spoke to Moshe, saying, Speak to Aharon and his sons, and to all the children of Israel, and say to them, Any man of the house of Israel, or of the strangers in Israel, who brings his offering for any of his vows, or for any of his voluntary offerings, which they bring to Yahweh as an ascending offering, for your acceptance is a male, a perfect one from the cattle, from the sheep, or from the goats. Whatever has a defect, you do not bring, for it is not acceptable for you. And when a man brings a slaughtering of peace offerings to Yahweh to complete a vow, or a voluntary offering from the cattle or the sheep, it is to be perfect, to be accepted. Let there be no defect in it. Those blind, or broken, or cut, or having an ulcer, or eczema, or scabs, you do not bring to Yahweh nor make an offering by fire of them on the slaughter place to Yahweh. As for a bull or a lamb that has any limb in deformed or dwarfed, you do prepare as a voluntary offering, but for a vow it is not accepted. Do not bring to Yahweh what is bruised or crushed or torn or cut, nor do it in your land. And from a son of a stranger's hand, you do not bring any of these as the bread of your Elohim for the corruption. Corruption is in them, and defects are in them, they are not acceptable for you. And Yahweh spoke to Moshe, saying, When a bull or a sheep or a goat is born, it shall be seven days with its mother, and from the eighth day and thereafter it is acceptable as an offering made by fire to Yahweh. But do not slay a cow or a sheep and its young on the same day. And when you slaughter a slaughtering of thanksgiving to Yahweh, slaughter it for your acceptance. It is eaten that same day, leave none of it till morning, I am Yahweh. And you shall guard my commands and do them, I am Yahweh. And do not profane my set-apart name, and I shall be set apart among the children of Israel. I am Yahweh who sets you apart, who brought you out of the land of Mitzrayim to be your Elohim. I am Yahweh. Okay, so this chapter further emphasizes the need for the priesthood to be completely set apart and not profane the name of Yahweh by treating the set apart matters of Elohim as common. There are many worldly habits that we still need to get rid of, and here we see the instruction that reminds us of that. You know, 
Just before we go into some of these things, uh, Nicole sent a message saying, so for a man to marry a divorced woman whose ex is not deceased, does this defile the man for service? No, because the woman is divorced and therefore she can be joined to another man. You know, so this won't defile the man for service. Remember, what we're looking at here is um, when we we're looking at the pattern of the priesthood doing service in the tabernacle and temple under the Levitical order, um, and then what would, what would render a priest unfit or fit for service in the tabernacle. Now, when we take this into Messiah, as I said, we've all seen as, as well that, that, you know, we also see in Scripture that when a woman is sent away, uh, it's quite clear our master, when he was in the flesh, gave these instructions in Matitio. When a woman is sent away, there's another procedure that's part of divorce. Part of a divorce is sending away. But just sending away without the certificate of divorce, without that, when she's joined to another, she causes that one to commit adultery because she hasn't legally been divorced. So the, the question here is that when there is a divorce and there's a separation, a proper procedure according to Scripture, certificate of divorce, reasons why, and sent out with the necessary provision, that's a clean break. Then she's permitted to be joined to another man. But when the proper procedure has not been done, she's still legally married. She can't be joined to another. So that's that's the, the, the difference that we see. I hope that helps. Okay. So one of the things that we see in Scripture about this chapter teaching us about being set apart continually on a practical level is how we conduct ourselves in everyday circumstances. And even more importantly, how we conduct ourselves when we're gathered together as an assembly or community in our master, as a set-apart gathering. You know, all too often we've sadly seen the very presence of Yahweh during a set-apart gathering being profaned in many ways. When people use coarse joking and people slander others, have a total disregard, we've seen over the last decade and a half, varying times where we've had to remind people, hold on, this is Yahweh's Sabbath. This should, Firstly, that kind of thing shouldn't be done outside of Sabbath either, but how about when people are gathering, you know, speaking about things that are actually very worldly and really not bringing and adhering to that reverent set-apartness that our Master's presence brings to us through His proper Sabbath-keeping. You know, and so in regarding to these instructions with true set-apartness, we must make a concerted effort to pull our lives out of all those circumstances or events that many might consider as normal, as we recognize that having been in exile for so long, we picked up nation-like habits, if you want to call it that. And through the patterns that we desperately need to overcome, we picked up a lot of those things that we have to throw off. We must, if we are not careful, we, we, we may end up defiling ourselves and the set apartness that we're called to and called to uphold. And the Sabbath is the very first major change that a new set apart life begins to live out. The others in the world might consider very strange. Well, yet we have to guard our set-apart lifestyle and must not be compromised in the least, you know, because we are to delight ourselves in the Shabbat. It, it, it should, we should call it a delight. We should delight ourselves in it. It shouldn't be, oh, do we have to do this again? When will it be over? That's what they were doing in, in Israel. Oh, can this thing get over? Because we want to get about our business. And so many people today still have that mindset. They come into Yahweh's presence and they fall asleep, not listening to the instructions. And as soon as Sabbath's over, it's like they've got a new burst of life. They're ready to run the race of whatever race they're running. That's compromising the delight of Yahweh's Sabbath. And that's what we must be on guard against. What we learn from these passages is walking in the fear of Yahweh. And when people come and they just switch off on the Shabbat because the world's been too rough for them, but they can't, get, can't wait to get back out and fight the world, but sleep 
their way right through the Shabbat and not concentrate and be, in, be active in engaging in the delighting of his, of his day that sets us apart. When people do that, it shows that they don't have the fear of Yahweh. You know, because they're treating the set-apart matters of Yahweh as common. And they're treating the common matters as actually more important to them. You know, so when we are set apart, which we should always be, we should not be found to engage in what is not set apart. I mean, that's obvious. These instructions remind us that we are to be constantly aware of who we are, where we find ourselves, and be sure that we're not touching as in engaging in the things that can render us unclean and unable to serve as the body of Messiah, you know, our high priest and king. Our, we praise our master. We have him as our intercessor who consistently is interceding for us day and night. So when we do find ourselves having fallen, we can run to him, confess and be cleansed. This doesn't give us a license to keep falling. But we thank our master that as we're growing in the knowledge of set apartness and as the things of this world are being brought to the surface, the dross must get off. You know, it's like through the trials and the pressures that we face, these things come to surface. It's up to us to scrape it off or throw it off and ask our master to cleanse us and wash us through his word, you know. This chapter also pictures for us the work of our master as the Passover lamb, of which no stranger may eat of unless, he buy, unless the priest buys the being with silver. That is another proof text that unless you've been immersed in the master and have been bought at a price, you have no right to be partaking of the Passover meal. That are those, that's what Kepha reminds us of, those that are feasting with you. They have no right, they're defiled. Our master bought us with silver. Silver is a picture of redemption in Scripture. He paid the price for our redemption. We are no longer foreigners in or to the covenants of promise, no longer strangers and without Elohim, but now we've been brought near by his blood. And silver is a picture of the purity of his word that's been refined in the earth seven times. As we know that this picture is the completeness of his appointed times as a we're going to look at in the next chapter because it's a complete pattern of taking from start where we need to be redeemed to working out that deliverance and being made complete when he comes again. Start to finish is what the appointed times teach us in our rehearsals of it. And so when it says that a bull or a lamb that has any deformed limb or dwarfed or is dwarfed, it might, it can be brought as a voluntary offering, but it cannot be brought as a vow offering. In other words, when one is making a vow to Yahweh, there's a, there's a deeper level of commitment and intimacy that one is committing oneself to. And to show that, you can't have any deformity in that. And that teaches us a valuable lesson that when you commit your life to the master and making a vow before him, you can't come later and say, oh, I was too quick. Because that's like bringing a deformed offering. But in a voluntary offering, what was permitted, if there was, it's like it's spontaneous. Hey, I just want to say thanks to Yahweh, but this is what I've got. Okay, that was permitted. And so we understand what, it, what this is saying for us here in many ways is because we've made that confession before many witnesses. We have made this vow of commitment to our master. And so when Shaul says, I call upon you, brothers, through the compassion of Elohim to present your bodies a living offering, set apart, no deformities, well-pleasing to Elohim, your reasonable worship. So when we are giving our lives as that daily living offering, it must be done in perfection of set apartness. It can't be done with defects in it, you know. Okay, Cheryl was just asking, please may I ask, if you and your wife are set apart, why would you get divorced? The word says that if you, div you get divorced, you cannot remarry until the other party passes away. Okay, our master made it very clear that Yahweh hates divorce, and it doesn't mean that you're never allowed to get divorced. In fact, 
uh, Torah is very clear. It gives permission. Yahweh divorced the house of Israel for whoring. Um, our master made it clear that one should not get divorced unless for the matter of whoring or, you know, breaking the marriage through unlawful union with others. And so there is a permissible way to get divorced. Um, and the word does not say that you cannot remarry until the other passes away when you're divorced. It does not say that unless you can show me that scripture. But what we are taking note of here is obviously this is still sitting fresh in the minds of some people in terms of marriage and divorce, and we deal with that through the year. And I'm not going to go in detail with it, but maybe just touch on it, that, you know, our master explained to the people when he was here in the flesh, and he said that, you know, because they were, they were saying that, you know, if he hates divorce, why is it, why did Moshe say, you know, that it's permissible, etc.? And so what we see is that it was never Yahweh's design, because when two joined together, there should be one. It was always that perfect design according to the mystery. However, because of hardness of heart, he permitted divorce. And so therefore, when he says in, is it Malachi or Micha, that Yahweh hates divorce, we must understand that root word for divorce there is the illegitimate separation because Yahweh himself divorced Israel. So when we understand, um, yes, Yeshua had to call back the lost tribes, his death allowed them to be able to come back, Yes, we understand that because we understand that the death of a covenanted one, the one is released from covenant. So that applies to the house of Yehuda, who where we understand that it's only by his life, death and resurrection that now a people are actually that covenant needs to be repaired because Yahweh doesn't break covenant. We understand that in his life, death and resurrection, Yehuda now has to accept the blood of Messiah because Yehuda was never officially divorced. But she had joined herself in whoring and became more treacherous than her sister, the house of Yisrael. Yisrael was divorced, unable to come. What, what the Torah actually says is the following. When a woman is divorced, which we know why, the reasons why, if there's, he, he finds uncoveredness in her, he may issue a certificate of divorce, send her out. So if she goes and joins herself to another and that other one divorces her, she's not permitted to come back to her original husband. That's the restriction. However, if she is divorced and sent out legally and she doesn't join herself to another, she is permitted to come back to her husband. That is Torah. But when she's joined herself to another, Israel joined herself to Baal. So she could not legally come back to Yahweh. That's why he also had to die and come and resurrect, be resurrected in order for the death of a covenanted one to be released in order to take his bride back legally. So I hope that makes sense. So let me just recap to hopefully settle any questions. A man and a woman are married. They get divorced. But now the woman goes and she joins herself to another, Baal. We're using Israel as the example. Legally, even when, if Baal issues a certificate of divorce and says, get out, I don't want you anymore, she cannot come back to her first husband because she's already joined and submit, submitted herself unto another covering. If she gets divorced from her original covering, goes out, doesn't join herself to any other, remains single, but then desires to come back and be reconciled, that is permitted. But Israel could not do that to Yahweh because after he issued a certificate of divorce, she'd already joined herself to Baal, but she continued in that. So therefore, the only way to take her back was to have her released be released from the covenant, the death of a covenanted one is released in order to restore a covenant that he never breaks because when he died in the flesh, made alive in the spirit, he never dies. So he keeps that commitment to covenant and gives access back to Yehuda, who had whored but had never been issued a certificate of divorce, and to Israel, who had joined herself and was illegally unable 
to come back. That's why we were without Elohim, unable to come back. But now by his blood are now brought near and able to be joined to him in marriage. I hope that makes sense. And Cheryl's saying thank you. Because it can be sometimes confusing to some people, and it's important that we clarify these things because people tend to often get parts of the Torah mixed up with other parts and misunderstand Shaul's interpretations, etc., etc., and teachings of the Torah. So coming back to this chapter, set-apart living calls for a service that seeks to please Elohim. And when reading all of the offerings that are acceptable and those that are not, we can clearly see from these that what we offer up in rendering our lives to our master must be done in complete set-apartness. No half-hearted attempts will be accepted. So you can't come and say, yeah, you know, I want to keep the Sabbath, but, you know, there's only one week in the month that I can keep a Sabbath, or, you know, there's one week in a month I've got to work. It doesn't work. And people use that. And they render and they justify why they can't be set apart. There's no justification for setting aside set apartness, you know. And so what you offer represents yourself. And so if your intention is not to bear fruit in the kingdom and let others eat of that good fruit because we are to bear the fruit of repentance, and remember, fruit of a tree is for others to eat of, so, you know, we partake in this walk together. If you're only in it to serve yourself when it's beneficial for you, so when it doesn't suit you, you don't do it, but when it suits you, you can do it. If that's your thing, then do not offer yourself for service to his house because you're wasting your time. I mean, I know it sounds tough for people to hear that, but that's the reality of the situation. So many people are rendering their lives as actually, you know what, you're doing this all wrong. And when we go through every week how to be set apart, it's for good measure. It's because we must learn to say no to the things that can nullify our set-apartness. Part of Yechezkel says that in the day that the righteous one turns to unrighteousness, all his righteousness is forgotten. But the one who's been unrighteous, in the day that he throws all that away and God's righteousness, he'll be accepted and his unrighteousness is forgotten. Therefore, God righteousness with your all. So these two chapters before the appointments that we're going to look at is all about the perfection of set-apartness and drawing near to Yahweh. That's what it really summarizes. And it teaches us that this standard has not changed in the order of Melchizedek in our high priest and king. In fact, it's brought it to a more higher valuable lesson of spirit and flesh, which we must understand is so important to God set apartness, especially as the world is getting darker and darker and darker, we must be shining brighter and brighter and brighter to the perfect day. Amen? Okay, who'd like to read chapter 23? And Yahweh spoke to Moshe, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, the appointed times of Yahweh, which you are to proclaim as set apart gatherings, my appointed times are these. Six days work is done, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of rest, a set apart gathering. You do no work, it is a Sabbath to Yahweh in, in all your dwellings. These are the appointed times of Yahweh, set apart gatherings, which you are to proclaim at their appointed times. In the first new moon, on the fourteenth day of the new moon, between the evenings is the Pesach to Yahweh. And on the fifteenth day of this new moon is the festival of Matzot to Yahweh. Seven days you eat unleavened bread. On the first day you have a set-apart gathering. You do no servile work. And you shall bring an offering made by fire to Yahweh for seven days. On the seventh day is a set-apart gathering. You do no servile work. And Yahweh spoke to Moshe, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, and you shall say to them, When you come into the land which I give you, and shall reap its harvest, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. And he shall wave the sheaf before Yahweh for your acceptance. On the morrow after the Sabbath, the priest waves it. And on that day when you wave the sheaf, you shall prepare a male lamb, a year old, a perfect one, as an ascending offering to Yahweh. And its grain offering, two tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil, an offering made by fire to Yahweh, a sweet fragrance, and its drink offering, one fourth of a hin of wine. And you do not eat bread or roasted grain or fresh grain until the same day that you have brought an offering to your Elohim 
a law forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. And from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheep of the wave offering, you shall count for yourselves seven completed Sabbaths. Until the morrow after the seventh Sabbath you count fifty days, then you shall bring a new grain offering to Yahweh. Bring from your dwellings for a wave offering two loaves of bread of two tenths of two tenths of an ephah fine flour they are, baked with leaven, first fruits to Yahweh. And besides the bread you shall bring seven lambs a year old, perfect ones, and one young bull and two rams. They are an ascending offering to Yahweh, with their grain offering and their drink offerings, an offering made by fire for sweet fragrance to Yahweh. And you shall offer one male goat as a sin offering, and two male lambs a year old as a slaughter of peace offerings. And the priest shall wave them besides the bread of the first fruits as a wave offering before Yahweh, besides the two, besides the two lambs. They are set apart to Yahweh for the priest. And on this same day you shall proclaim a set apart gathering for yourselves. You do no servile work on it, a law forever in your dwellings throughout your generations. And when you reap the harvest of your land, do not completely reap the corners of your field when you reap, and do not gather any gleaning from your harvest. Leave them for the poor and for the stranger. I am Yahweh your Elohim. And Yahweh spoke to Moshe, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh new moon, on the first day of the new moon, you have a rest, a remembrance of Teruah, a set apart gathering. You do no servile work, and you shall bring an offering made by fire to Yahweh. And Yahweh spoke to Moshe, saying, On the tenth day of this seventh new moon is Yom HaKippurim. It shall be a set apart gathering for you, and you shall afflict your beings, and shall bring an offering made by fire to Yahweh. And you do no work on that same day, for it is Yom Kippurim, to make atonement for you before Yahweh your Elohim. For any being who is not afflicted on that same day, he shall be cut off from his people. And any being who does any work on that same day, that being I shall destroy from the midst of his people. You do no work, a law forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. It is a Sabbath of rest to you, and you shall afflict your beings. On the ninth day of the new moon at evening, from evening to evening, you observe your Sabbath. And Yahweh spoke to Moshe, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, On the fifteenth day of this seventh new moon is the festival of Sukkot for seven days to Yahweh. On the first day is a set-apart gathering, you do no servile work. For seven days you bring an offering made by fire to Yahweh. On the eighth day there shall be a set-apart gathering for you, and you shall bring an offering made by fire to Yahweh. It is a closing festival, you do no servile work. These are the appointed times of Yahweh, which you proclaim as set apart gatherings, to bring an offering made by fire to Yahweh, an ascending offering and a grain offering, a slaughtering and drink offerings, as commanded for every day. Besides the Sabbaths of Yahweh, and besides your gifts, and besides all your vows, and besides all your voluntary offerings which you give to Yahweh. On the fifteenth day of the seventh new moon, when you gather in the fruit of the land, celebrate the festival of Yahweh for seven days. On the first day is a rest, and on the eighth day a rest. And you shall take for yourselves on the first day the fruit of good trees, branches of palm trees, twigs of leafy trees, and willows of the streams of the stream, and shall rejoice before Yahweh your Elohim for seven days. And you shall celebrate it as a festival to Yahweh for seven days in the year, a law forever in your generations. Celebrate it in the seventh new moon. Dwell in booths for seven days, all you, all who are native born in Israel, dwell in booths. So that your generations know that I made the children of Israel dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Mitzrayim. I am Yahweh your Elohim. Thus did Moshe speak of the appointed times of Yahweh to the children of Israel. Okay, after that lengthy uh, explanation on divorce, I see Carol's just saying, please clarify 1 Corinthians 7, 39 and Romans 7, 2 to 3. Let me just highlight Romans 7, 2 to 3 and 1 Corinthians 7, verse 39 is in reference to a, a woman who's married to her husband. And as long as a wife is married to her husband, she is bound to her husband. And she's only then released from that binding at the death of her husband. When a woman is divorced, she doesn't have a husband anymore. So, so we got to, no, I want to clarify, we, we can't use those verses to what we were talking about. Because he's dealing with, first of all, in Corinthians, he's saying, listen, if somebody is, is alone, it's, it's, in his opinion, it is better to be alone. But if you're burning inside, then join yourself. And then here's the thing. Now, a wife is bound to her husband as long as her husband lives. And that's the Torah. She's bound by that. And she's only released from that when her husband dies. But in the, this, he's not talking about divorce here. It's got nothing to do with divorce. And neither is Romans 7. 
So we just got to just remember that he's speaking in context of marriage. And in, when one is married and a wife does join herself to another man, then she's an adulteress when she joins herself because she's only released when her husband dies. So the only way you can be released in marriage is through divorce. And we, our master makes it except through, it's only through that which is adultery. So we, we just need to set all the things right to make clear what we're saying here and teaching here, that we're not crossing lines and shoals, not teaching something different. We've got to understand context, you know. So I hope that settles any questions in our minds. Then we come to possibly in our day, now all scripture is important, extremely important. We don't miss a beat. But however, this chapter is so critical in teaching people how important it is to guard the Sabbaths of Yahweh. They are his feasts. They're not the feast of the Jews. Yahweh says very clearly to Moshe, the appointed times of Yahweh are these. They're his appointed times. They're our rehearsals. He tells us his appointments that he has with his bride, and we better show up. That's really what's being told here. And what's Worth taking note of is the clear placement of this chapter in laying out for us these appointed times. It fits perfectly in line with the instructions for set-apart living. And by observing these appointed times, these feasts, we become further established as his set-apart bride. This chapter is a chapter that many exiles need to study in great depth. Not only study, but apply and in allowing the great understanding of the feasts that is gained in the doing of these feasts to further love him and grow in intimacy with our king and know that without him there is nothing. And find that when we call the Sabbath a delight, what we take note of here, Yahweh sets a standard here because he says, he first says, these are my appointed times. And these appointed times you are to proclaim and announce as set-apart gatherings, as Kadesh, Mikra, Mikra, Kadesh, they are set-apart gatherings. They And the appointed times are these, and then he starts with the Sabbath. Six days' work is done, that's when you do your work in the field with the gifts and talents that you've been given, and on the Sabbath is a Sabbath of rest to Yahweh. You do no work, you do no occupational work that you do in the six days of the week. We know the priests rendered a service on the Sabbath. There were Sabbath offerings. Today is the eighth new moon, so in, in the Levitical order, there would have been extra offerings that were done by the priests on this day if it was the beginning of a month and the Sabbath. But that's not the occupational work that's done by the nations as they come on the Sabbath to delight in Yahweh and the service of that which the priest would render to bring near and the nation would hear the very words of our master through the priesthood, through Moshe, the Torah, that's delivered by those appointed to teach. So these are the appointed times. It is a Sabbath to Yahweh in all your dwellings. These are the appointed times of Yahweh, set-apart gatherings. Just in case you didn't get the first announcement that these are set-apart gatherings, he says it again. And you uh, proclaim it at their appointed time. So twice Yahweh is saying, proclaim these as appointed times. Emphasis here. Proclaim as appointed times. These are my appointed times, Sabbath. Sabbath sets the standard. Then you proclaim these. What's proclaimed? Well, the appointments that are regarded as a Sabbath. That's what's really being highlighted here. So as we go through these, you know, you can look at the notes. I've gone, I think there's like 150 pages on expanding on this chapter. So I'm certainly not going to go through that line for line right now. I want to just give a highlight as we journey through this wonderful cycle that we go through every year to remind us from beginning to end who we are in Messiah what we've been brought into, what we are walking toward, what we are to guard to in, ensure that what we are walking toward may be completed. You know, set apart is the theme of Yahweh's bride because that is what he's called for, a set apart bride. And a set apart bride goes to the appointments that he has with her. 
these are his dates with us, his bride, his called out ones. Show up a day late, not a very good bride, are you? Show up a month late, not a very good bride, are you? You know, we've got to be on guard against the way the world interprets a service unto the Creator that deviates from his clear pattern set out in this extremely important passage. You know, you can understand why the anti-Messiah spirit says we don't need Leviticus. We don't need Vaikra, because Vaikra and he called. In other words, you don't need to hear the voice of Yahweh. I'll tell you, I'll whisper to you. What The word says this, but. So he's using the same tactic. And that is, has been a tactic of so many religions and various forms of presentation of the word that's done according to the teachings of man, but has cast aside the commands of Elohim. This, the, this chapter that we're looking at here are commands of Elohim, gatherings, you know. And the Sabbath is a time where we come to gather. Now we thank Yahweh that we're able to gather with our, our covenant family online too. This is, I believe, in this day and age, what he's equipped us, enabled us to do. Sadly, there are many who have the ability to be physically together with those in the body, and they choose not to. Now, I understand when you don't want to be with people that are compromising. I'm not talking about that, you know. I'm talking about people that wake up and they feel, ah, uh, you know, and they have the ability to be in physical gatherings where many of our brothers and sisters that are online are longing and would desire to be physically with us, but yet they're up setting the alarms at 2 o'clock so they can join in. This is exciting for me because it highlights for me the seriousness of wanting to be together in our Master's presence. And that's the delight that we are to have because it's proclaimed, it's announced as these are the appointments, you know. And so in the first new moon, I'll just run through these and just give some key points, you know, as to how we start the year, what we then begin with. We understand from our last 15 years of records of calendar keeping that the new moon closest to the equinox, we call it for today's terminology, the March equinox, because, you know, whether you want in Northern Hemisphere or Southern Hemisphere, the, the seasons are opposite. But that equinox that we all know in the beginning of the, the year, the March equinox, that new moon closest to that begins the year. Because in Bereshit 1 verse 14, our master made it clear that the lights in the expanse are for the appointed times, for the days, the seasons, the years. And so therefore, if our master made it clear before there was even an Adam and a Chava, that the lights are there to declare the cycles of years and months. Now we know the sun divides the year into its seasons. Okay. And the moon gives us the regulation of time of a renewal every month. So we get the months from the moons, we get the seasons from the sun, together we get the start of the year. That is the declaration. Then we get agricultural witnesses that confirm the declaration. And so when our master called Israel out of Mitzrayim and he says, this will be the beginning of new moons for you, Yahweh wasn't changing his calendar. He was realigning his called out people back into his perfect timing because they were enslaved into a sun worship system in Mitzrayim that had changed Yahweh's timing for mankind to their own worship of the sun. You know, Ra was depicted as the sun deity, and we've been through that with the plagues. But what we do take note of, he says, this in this month, the Aviv, then people get caught up solely on the Aviv alone. And then traditions of man become enacted as teachings that are taught as authoritative as if it's the word of Elohim, that it now solely goes on the Aviv reports that come from the land of Israel. I'm not disregarding reports that come from the land, but I'm not solely basing our year start on them, because there are other factors that are to be considered. As many agricultural factors witness the season of spring in the Northern Hemisphere, as to the timing of which new moon 
is aligned with the circuit of the sun in determining the seasons that we begin to understand our start. Now this year, we understand that there's many things beyond the, the barley. There's the migration of birds that take place. There's the flowering of the, the certain plants and fields and fruit trees that begin to bud. That witness the aviv could best be understood. I know we see in dictionaries green ears, but with the barley being aviv and the season of aviv, we understand that it carries more than just the witness of the barley. It's representing springtime. You know, which the sun aids us in understanding the dividing of the seasons. And many people want to get caught up. No, you can't use the sun. It's sun worship. No, we use the lights that Yahweh's given us. We're not worshiping it. And to disregard the cycle of the sun is a disrespect and disregard for Yahweh's instructions in Bereshit 1. And so we have to take it all into account. Now, understanding the best way I could do it, as I explained earlier this year, is that the sun and the moon, along with the stars, declare the times. The earth witnesses the declaration. So this year we saw very clearly there were conflicting reports. And it was abundantly clear through our records of 15 years that the Bali is always Aviv after the equinox. So if you start the year with the new moon closest to the equinox, either side of it, by the time you come to Pesach on the 15th of the month, and then you get to the first day of the wave offering, which could be the 17th, it's not always that, but it could be later. It's always the Sabbath during, the, after the Sabbath during Matzot. The Bali is always Aviv. You, you don't have to worry about it. You don't have to get into a Hollywood panic th thriller about, is it Aviv, is it not? Yahweh promised that he would provide. And he's given his appointments. This year, the Bali was Aviv when we started the year and for the waving of the sheaf. There were different reports that went out when people were saying it's not Aviv, but the time they started the year, the harvest already been underway for Bali, which the harvest shouldn't start until the wave offering that we've just read here. So we saw this year conflicting things. And, you know, what do you follow? Do you go with the masses that follow rabbinically influenced traditions? and leaning toward going with that? Or do you look to what Yahweh has given us as in a, the lights in the sky, confirmed by the witnesses? We're not neglecting that there was barley or wasn't barley. We're saying, we're saying there was. And there was other factors that were there too. There's another 10 different things that we could look at. We come to now this time, we've just had Sukkot. And we know that that turn of the year, that equinox that typically is in September time, looking at the set, this is seven, Latin for seven, so the seventh month. We see that equinox taking place. We also see that even today, agriculturally speaking, we have the witness that many of the fields, as I said earlier today at the beginning, are already being planted and sown for the coming seasons, which shows that if you have only starting the seventh month now, agriculturally, you're not in, the, in line with the witness that you solely rely on to start your year. But then why do people not look at Sukkot and how it fits in? So we must understand that we don't align ourselves with agricultural things to declare. Rather, we see them as witnesses to confirm. Because if you look to the earth to declare, it can be manipulated by man. But when you look to that which our master set in the expanse, you can follow that and with great joy and delight see how he witnesses the confirmation of his timing every single year. So we started with Pesach and we go through, it's eaten on the 15th of the month. At the 14th, between the evenings, you, you uh, slay your Pesach. So at the 14th, when our master had a meal with his taught ones, it wasn't the Passover meal. It was a very instructional meal that he was, he was having to establish a new ordinance that would be done by his blood. And so at the end of the 13th, at sunset on the 13th, he had a meal with his taught ones, beginning the 14th. And from sunset of the 14th all the way through to sunset of the 15th, which is between the evenings of the 14th, because the, at even time, that's when the slaying of the lambs would take place. Our master was, had a meal with his taught ones. And Yehuda from Kirioth went out. He, you know, went to betray the master. He was arrested that night. The following day, 
after having been flogged and whipped and beaten by our transgressions, put on a stake, offered up his breath, and before offering up his breath and saying it's finished, he received the last of the leaven by taking the sour wine that was put to his mouth. And then there was a great earthquake and darkness came over the earth. And then, uh, who was the guy that came and asked to get his body? Yosef, Yosef from Ramathaim, yes, came and asked Pilate, can he please take down the body before sunset? Because we see in the Torah that the land is cursed when a body is left on the stake past sunset. And so he was taken down and laid in a tomb just before sunset. And so he laid in the tomb for three days and three nights. But at the death of the master, the graves of many were opened. But they stayed open for the three days and three nights. And after the resurrection of our master, at the end of Sabbath, during the week of unleavened bread, so on, let's, I'm going to say it for those that are learning new, <clears throat> on the Sabbath, Sunset Sabbath. So if we were there today, at the sunset today begins the first day of the week. And at that sunset, at the ending of the first day of the week, our master rose from the dead. On the seventh day, yes. Sunset of the Sabbath. Yeah. Sorry, I said? Okay. Oh, sorry, at the end of the, okay. at the end of the seventh day, at the end of the Sabbath begins the first day of the week. And that is when our master rose on the first day of the week. So that ties in with that text. Then the, those who were tombs were opened, came out of the graves because our master is the firstborn from the dead. They came up and appeared to many. I mean, they went knocking on doors and saying, hi, I'm here. What an occasion. You've got to think. I mean, it would have been pretty scary for some. That next morning, when the woman went to the tomb and they saw the stone was rolled away, and then Messiah, when he appeared to them, he says, don't touch me, I still have to go to the Father. Remember, as the role of the son, as the role of the high priest, he's still now in his resurrected form, he's going to present the Omer Rashid. That is what's done on the morrow after the Sabbath during Matzot, the sheaf of the first. And it's from that day of the waving of the sheaf of the first that the high priest would do that you begin to count for yourself seven completed Sabbaths, not seven sevens, because rabbinic tradition says you have the Passover meal on the 14th, the 15th is the thing, and the 16th you do the wave offering, irregardless of what day of the week it is, and you begin to count to Shavuot seven sevens. It's seven completed Sabbaths. If you do not count it from the first day of the week, you may have a cycle of 50 that contains more than seven Sabbaths in it or less. So it's seven completed Sabbaths. And so Shavuot, the counting to Shavuot, will always teach us that Shavuot is always on the first day of the week. It is not a time that was now the change of Sabbath to Sunday because, you know, Pentecost is, is the Greek word for 50 count, count to 50. Okay? And so the believers that were gathered on Shavuot were not in the upper room where the taught ones were staying, but they were gathered where Kepha was administering to them, and the 120 that were gathered for this purpose, the set-apart spirit was poured out. So let's come back to Passover. Our master is the Passover lamb. He removes. We get leaven out of our houses. So we don't have that which is leavened in our house. It's a picture of the removal of sin. And for seven days, we eat unleavened bread. It's part of the command too. On the Passover, we have the Passover lamb, unleavened bread, and we drink the cup of the master and bitter herbs. Don't drink the bitter herbs, you eat them. Okay, and we have a night of watches. This is a law forever throughout your generations. We stay awake. And then we have the seven days of unleavened bread with the Omer Rashid, not the Bikurim. It's very important. Most people like to put pictures in different feast times and, you know, in the picture of the menorah, and they keep putting Bikurim by Shavuot. The big, I mean, they, that's right to put it by shovel. They keep putting the bikurim by matzot, unleavened bread. The first fruits is brought at 
the Feast of Weeks, which is Shavuot. The first of the first is waved, the Omer Rishi, the first of the Bikurim, if you will. And it's important because the first secures the last. And when we look at Chazan, the 144,000 that Yochanan sees as the first fruits to the Lamb, there's 244,000 in Chazan, chapter 7 and chapter 14. Now, the, the, the chapter 7 one where the 144,000 are sealed, it's a metaphorical number that highlights what takes place during Matzot. Because the first fruits to the Lamb, 144,000, and then those that are sealed, 144,000, it's showing the first secures the last. It's a metaphorical picture because Yahweh shows his loving commitment to a thousand generations of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Therefore, with every tribe having 12,000, it highlights a body that one part represents the next. So every tribe being 12,000 highlights that each tribe represents the whole tribe. 12 12s is 144,000. That's why it's first fruits to the Lamb. Because we, I'm not saying that there was a literal 144,000 that rose from the graves after our Master's resurrection, but we understand the complete loving commitment of our Master to Israel is depicted by these numbers and this picture of the Omer Rashid representing the first fruits of the Lamb, him declaring that now there is a harvest to come, that he, without the first, there's no security of the end time harvest. So then when our master had presented this, it establishes the new order of the Levitical priesthood and that which, um, the order of the order of the Malkit, Kitzedek priesthood and that which is to come to rule and reign with him in his millennial reign that he's coming for. He then appeared to his taught ones. And when he appeared in a closed room to his taught ones, he breathed on them the set-apart spirit that he told them to wait for. But they, clo the closed taught ones that were with him, because he appeared to about 500 people over the 40-day period. But the ones that were close to him, his taught ones that were in the the inner room after his resurrection, or the, the closed room, that was a first of the first again, because at Shavuot, the 120 believers and that were they received the set-apart spirit and everybody that came for the feast heard their own language and they were saying, what's this? That was a renewal of the marriage covenant as a complete repair as the witness of our master saying, by doing that, what, is for, what he says is, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. It's a promise to come. And so we understand these first of the firsts that take place. So we must divorce ourselves from rabbinically influenced teachings that, first of all, teach Bikurim is during Matzah. It's not, because then you don't understand what it's all about, what first fruits is about at Shavuot. It's the renewal of the marriage covenant. What does it entail? What is it secure as in the picture of Chazon and the bride being made complete? We also take note, that while many rabbinics today are celebrating what they say Rosh Hashanah, because we're in the first of the eighth month, not the seventh, but the seventh month is not Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah is the beginning of the year. You don't have the seventh month beginning the year because they want to teach in tradition that this was the day that Yahweh made Adam. Extra writings of man that have been taught as teachings. So I'm highlighting this to you to make you understand. So this counting to Shavuot teaches us to count who we are in the Master. Having been rid of sin, now having the good leaven worked into us so that by the time we are able to recognize this marriage covenant that we have been grafted into, that the loaves that are waved, the wave offering, the tenufa, that's waved before the Master as acceptable before him as a representation of the two houses, Israel and Yehuda being brought together in one by the blood of Messiah as acceptable. Now, our master comes and he tells his taught ones before he died and was resurrected when he met the Shomeroni woman, and they didn't want to say anything, you shouldn't be speaking to a Shomeroni, etc. And then he tells them, do not say four months till the harvest. So from Shavuot to the seventh month, Shavuot's in the third month of the year, to the seventh month is four months. We shouldn't be just sitting around, waiting around, we got to be workers in the field. The harvest is plenty. The workers are few. Pray that the master sends workers. This is what we are. We are to be about the master's business. When he comes, will he find belief? 
Now, when no one knows the day or the hour, that has been misinterpreted by so many people who don't follow the Torah as that he can come any day of the year. Now, for any person that dies any day of the year, yes, I understand that, because when they die and they wake up when he comes or don't wake up, that's the day. But we know Yom Teruah is also not the day our master returns, as some teach. Yom Teruah is the awakening blast. It's the announcement that he's coming. The parable of the maidens, five wise, five foolish, is about Yom Teruah and who has oil in their lamps, who has been working the field, who has been walking according to the Spirit, and who has neglected to exercise their belief through obedience. Because when Yom Teruah comes and that awakening blast comes, it's too late to be trying to now get oil, walk in the Spirit, because then the 10 days between Yom Teruah and Yom Kippur, we see a picture again of a testing, a separation, a sifting, a a clear witness of Yahweh's wrath being poured out on the sons of disobedience, where those that are sealed in him, as pictured by the 144,000, not a literal number that some, you know, try to teach as a pyramid scheme. What we understand is that those who are in the master need not fear what man does. Do not fear the one who can kill the flesh, but have fear for the one who can kill the flesh and the body in Sheol. So we walk in reverence of our master. We find these 10 days as flesh and spirit in Shul. We, we, we have these days of Yaakov's distress that's known by, as in Vayikra, we see Yahweh's wrath being poured out as the seals are opened, the trumpets are blown. And we find refuge in the name of our master in Elohim. What we now take note of is that when Yom Kippur comes, that is when he comes out of the most set apart place. He takes off his priestly robes or high priest robes as interceding for his people. And he puts on his kingly robes, which means there's no more intercession. So when he comes to fetch his ready bride, those who have oil in their lamps, he's also coming to reject those who did not. And he will trample the winepress in his wrath and there'll be a separation between sheep and goats, between sheep and sheep. And those who are his are known by him. And for four days he gathers from the four corners of the earth his bride, where then he will take us to Jerusalem to booth with him as a marriage feast before the millennial reign is established, where we will, those who are part of the first resurrection will rule and reign with him. Blessed are those who have part in the first resurrection, because that will take place on Yom Kippur, for those who are in the master, if you have died and are asleep, you'll be raised first. Then those who are still alive in the master will be changed in the twinkling of an eye, putting off this corruption and putting on incorruption so that you rule with him forever, thousand year reign and be with him forever, because the second death which takes place at the end of the millennial reign will have no power over those that are part of the first resurrection. It's appointed for all men to die once. But we see in the book of Yehuda a rebuke for those that have gone in the way of Cain and the error of, of uh, Bilam, etc., that they're twice dead because it's a picture again of it's appointed for all men to die once. But then comes the judgment seat at the end of the millennial reign where the second resurrection of those that have died are raised and, and those that are in Sheol are given up and then they stand. And if their names are not found written in the book of life, they are thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, which is not having power over those part of the first resurrection. I hope this is the kind of summation of this. But before we get to the judgment seat, we come from Yom Kippur, which is a day where we afflict our beings. Now, Yom Teruah, we are told to have a remembrance of Teruah. Most people don't know what to do, especially those that teach traditions. But the remembrance is a theme right through Scripture, because at Shavuot, we're told to remember that we were slaves in Mitzrayim, so that we remember who we are now in Messiah and guard who we are and not forget who we are in him, because if we forget him, he'll forget us. And by the time we come to Yom Teruah, we have a remembrance that we're married, where the trumpet sounded long on the mountain at Mount Sinai as Yahweh entered into a marriage covenant with Israel. So too were there tongues of fire 
There wasn't literally tongues of fire coming down, but the sound, the rushing of wind, the voice of Yahweh, we hear at Shavuot, the renewal of the marriage covenant that takes place. Because in the third month, when Israel came out of Mount Sinai, out of Mitzrayim, they were at Mount Sinai at Shavuot, entering into this marriage covenant. And Yahweh now renews this covenant again in Jerusalem, not at Mount Sinai, not with a mountain scorched with fire, but he comes to Jerusalem and he pours out his spirit on those that were gathered in obedience as a clear witness of remembrance that he never forgot his covenant with Abraham. And so in Yom Teruah, we celebrate that we are betrothed, that we have his spirit, the pledge of our inheritance to come, therefore awakening in us endurance, knowing that, yes, we are married so we can keep enduring even when the wrath of Yahweh is being poured out because he is in control. And by the time Yom Kippur comes where we afflict our beings and we are busy with our inner man, so we fast on that day and we fasting without praying is just another form of diet but we 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 have the sabbath of sabbaths irregardless of what day it's on because yom kippur typically is a rehearsal of that which is to come but on that final yom kippur that is when he comes to make the deliverance of his bride complete now, there's two factors to the seventh day that we see in creation week, we see being lived out when our master comes. Firstly, we're told on the Sabbath, he completed his work, then rested. The first part of his completion of his work is the redemption of his bride, which takes place on Yom Kippur. The second part of that completion is at the end of his millennial reign, when Satan is let loose, because Yom Kippur is also a recognition of the two goats that are one for Yahweh and one for Azazel. Azazel is sent into the wilderness as a picture of Satan being bound for the thousand years so there is no influence on people, but yet people will still find themselves in the error of the ways. But Satan is then let loose for a short time to see who he can gather. He can't gather those part of the first resurrection because they've already put on the incorruptible. But those that have been born during the millennial reign, you know, they have to still submit to the Torah. But Satan's going to try and lure some of them away, and he's going to try and get an army in Har Megiddo, you know. And once he is destroyed and thrown into the lake of fire, that is Yahweh's completion of his work for the seven days as he has the judgment seat. And those who are not in the book of life are also thrown into the lake of fire that second death takes place, and then the renewal comes that Yochanan is given visions of with a new Yerushalayim coming down, which is the set-apart bride of the Master. This is who we are. This is who we are being built up as. And that's what the feasts teach us. Because then when we go from Yom Kippur, our deliverance made complete, there's great joy and excitement and rejoicing to booth with our Elohim because the revelation of Messiah makes it very clear that he makes his booth with men. There's no longer need of a sun and a moon. It doesn't mean the functions of light won't be there, but it won't be needed to announce when he's coming because he'll be with us forever. Notice revelation doesn't say there'll be no need of a moon. There'll be no need of barley. It says no need of the sun and the moon because that's what gives us our appointed times. And when he boots with us forever, we don't need to know when he's with us because we're with him forever. And that's what Sukkot is a rehearsal of. Where we also understand right now in our rehearsal of Sukkot, we're told to dwell in tents for seven days, all who are native born of Israel. Why? So we remember what our fathers did when for 40 years they were in the wilderness. They didn't have to be 40 years in the wilderness, but they were because of disobedience, as a sifting out would take place for that generation. But we dwell in booths and are commanded to rejoice. And we are reminded that we are sojourning here with the Master, and we are to rejoice continually. Shaul says rejoice always. And when it says all who are native-born, most people say, you see, you know, well, I don't need to stay in a tent or a temporary dwelling because, you know, I'm not... I'm not, an, I'm not an Israeli. Native born, we are told in scripture that any stranger or foreigner who's not part and comes and is bought at a price and is allowed to partake in the Passover meal, he becomes as a native born. In other words, we are now understanding the spirit of adoption. 
We were once not a people, but now we are the people of Elohim. And being a pe people of Elohim in Messiah, in his genealogy, we are native born. And therefore, we guard the need to dwell in tents for seven days. So we can see a way to identify with what they went through. Yes. You know, <laughs> this, this Sukkot we had, we... we, we we had some wonderful weather changes. We had some cold, hot, windy, still, uh, stormy, uh, yeah, rough water conditions. But, you know, it was interesting because we had very limey water, which reminds me of Laodicea, you know, with the mixing. And how it teaches us about when you are sukkoting, if I can say, boothing with the master, it's really teaching us what it ultimately means to be set apart. And so as we go through all these feasts, now I've just tried to give a summary, in an enlarged summary. You know, every time we come to the appointed times, I give a full teaching on this. And, and you can look at the notes. But I, wanna just, I wanted to just go through this in terms of what we see here as that which, and if I've missed something, look at the notes. I, I, you know, I'm trying to give a, a jet fly through <laughs> of the feast from beginning to end and how it's important that we don't miss the beat. We don't, you know, the Hebrew word for feet, regal, is often used times, three times a year. Those three times a year incorporate all seven feasts. So we shouldn't miss a step of obedience. And part of those steps is including the Sabbath. You can't be saying, oh, I'll do the feast, but I can't do all the Sabbaths because then you're out of step. And so... The instructions that are very clear for each feast and, you know, gathering all the different kinds of trees that we see here. Sometimes some of us in a scattered state still today might find ourselves camping, but we can't find willows or, you know, and, and uh, palm trees. But you find what's it was a reminder of all the different terrains that our forefathers went through because the wilderness journey wasn't just desert. Some parts were arid. Some were very lush, some were mountainous, where they had to go through valleys, and others were plains. They went past cities, had to stay separate. So every different terrain that they went through, it would be a reminder, bringing all these different kinds of branches and fruit trees, etc., would remind them of the journey. And so we do this in cele celebration of our master, and we, 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 we live. Dwelling in booths is we live. And we live and we rejoice in the master. And we spoke about that recently. You can go and look at the, 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 the Shemini Atzeret because the eighth day, again, on the eighth day you have a set-apart gathering. That, that is a symbol of a reminder of the renewal that's to come with the renewed Yerushalayim coming down and reminds us that we have access to the waters of life that Yochanan sees in his vision at the revelation of Yeshua Messiah. And when our master stood up on that last great day of Sukkot and said, all who are thirsty come, he gave that invitation to say, you know what? We don't only need to rehearse these as, uh, how can I say, just ticking a box. We get to understand the rehearsals and what's to come, therefore being ardent not to miss a step every single Shabbat that leads us to the set-apart gatherings and appointments that our Master desires for us to delight in so that when we have him forever, it, we see dimly as in a mirror now, but one day we're going to see him as he sees us. How awesome is that? You know? So anything out of this chapter that anybody wants to ask, you can do so, but I think I've, I've tried my best to just give an overview, highlighting some key points. But for details of each feast, you can look at our site, our website on the notes. You can look at YouTube for the various videos. Um, covers and expands on this greatly in terms of what we are to be in our master. Okay, so let's read chapter 24. Unless anybody wants to share anything. Did you want to? No? Ooh, okay. Who's reading 24? 
And Yahweh spoke to Moshe, saying, Command the children of Israel that they bring to you clear oil of pressed olives for the light, to make the lamps burn continually. Outside the veil of the witness, in the tent of appointment, Aaron is to arrange it from evening until morning before Yahweh continually, a law for ever throughout your generations. He is to arrange the lamps on the clean gold lampstand before Yahweh continually. And you shall take fine flour and bake twelve cakes with it, two tenths of an ephah in each cake. And you shall set them in two rows, six in a row, on the clean table before Yahweh. And you shall put clear frankincense on each row, and it shall be on the bread as a remembrance portion, an offering made by fire to Yahweh. On every Sabbath he is to arrange it before Yahweh continually, from the children of Israel, an everlasting covenant. And it shall be for Aaron and his sons, and they shall eat it in the set-apart place, because it is most set-apart to him from the offerings of Yahweh made by fire, an everlasting law. And the son of a Israeli woman, whose father was a Mitzrian man, went out among the children of Israel. And the Israeli woman's son and a man of Israel strove in the camp. And the Israeli woman's son blasphemed the name and cursed. So they brought him to Moshe. Now his mother's name was Shelomith, the daughter of Divri, of the tribe of Dan. And they put him under the guard, that it might be declared to them at the mouth of Yahweh. And Yahweh spoke to Moshe, saying, Bring the one who has cursed outside the camp, and all those who heard him shall lay their hands on his head, and all the congregation shall stone him. And speak to the children of Israel, saying, Anyone who curses his Elohim shall, be, shall bear his sin, and he who blasphemes the name of Yahweh shall certainly be put to death, and all the congregation certainly stone him, the stranger as well as the native. When he blasphemes the name, he is put to death. And a man who strikes the being of any man shall certainly be put to death. And he who strikes a beast repays it, body for body. And when a man inflicts a blemish upon his neighbor, as he has done, so it is done to him. Fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. As he inflicts a blemish upon him, so it is done to him. And he who strikes a beast repays it, and he who strikes a man to death is put to death. You are to have one right ruling, for the stranger and for the native, for I am Yahweh your Elohim. And Moshe spoke to the children of Israel, and they brought the one who cursed outside the camp, and stoned him with stones. And the children of Israel did as Yahweh commanded Moshe. Okay, so in verse 1 we see the command being used here in a very militaristic way. You know, and I think that's the way we must approach all the word of Yahweh. And when I say militaristic, it's not a bad thing. It's, I'm paying attention, like a soldier should listen to the commander's orders, you know. And so what we see here, the importance that was being called for, for clear oil of pressed olives to be brought so that the light, the lamps, could burn continually. This was a responsibility for everyone. And this is a responsibility for all of us. We are to let our light shine continually. So therefore, having come to Yom Teruah, if you don't have oil, you can't shine. And to put that more practically, if you're not walking according to the Spirit, which is to do the Torah, because the Torah is spiritual, it's from above, it's our Master's instructions, then you can't shine. You know, then you are walking around in darkness. Joel reminds us that we were once darkness, but now we are children of light. Live as children of light. You know, we must not be found to be like the five foolish maidens without oil. The high priest was to arrange it day and night before Yahweh. And there are very important lessons that we can glean from these instructions here. Firstly, clear oil could only be obtained by the process of olives being crushed as the weight of a millstone would be put on another millstone where a hessian bag with olives would be crushed in order to break the olives and then placed under an olive press, olive press a Gethsemane, where the oil would be squeezed out under immense pressure. Our, our master intercedes for us day and night. He's continually interceding for us before his throne, as, and he also, as depicted through the revelation and the visions that Yochanan was given as the one who walks amongst the lampstands, lampstands, you know. Now the Hebrew word for clear is zach. It means pure, clear, or clean, and it comes from the verb zachach, which means to be pure or to be bright. bright. And zach is used in Mishle 21 verse 8 where it says, the way of a guilty man is perverse, but as for the innocent, his work is right. So when we are 
clear and been cleansed by our master, we must understand that once we were now guilty, he's removed, cleansed our conscience from guilt. Therefore, we stand innocent before him. Now we are to remain in that innocence, you know. And the Hebrew word for pressed, kathith, means beaten. And it also means to crush by beating. And we understand this word is only used five times, and it's always used in conjunction with the oil that is brought from pressed olives, you know. And the Hebrew word for light um, teaches us a valuable lesson about how we are to be the light of our master. The very, you know, in the beginning, our master made clear separations. And, one, and the first separation that he made was the light from the darkness. You know, to, to, as a clear witness of how he's the one that gives that clear separation, there's no gray matter, so to speak, with Yahweh. You're either walking in the light or you're not. And one of the things that we understand when our master is the light of this earth and he calls us to be the light of the earth and the salt of the earth, he's calling us to be in him. And the, and the Hebrew word for light is ner. And it's a nun and a riash. And in the pictographics, it's a picture of the sprouting seed, which represents life, the nun, and a riash, the head of a man, which is captain, chief, top, our master. So even the pictograph of the Hebrew word for light teaches us that we have life in the head. And so therefore, if we are not in him, our head, we have no life. He came to give us life and life abundantly, calling us out of darkness. You know, Yeshua, the light of the world, has caused us to be equipped to shine his truth. The enemy doesn't want us to shine. Kazon says that the dragon is enraged with the woman and he went to fight with the remnant of her seed. Who is the remnant? Those guarding the commands of Elohim and possessing the witness of Yeshua Messiah. Now this word for lamp, sorry, no, I'm saying light is ur, lamp is ner. I'm going to get that right. Now, David, in his celebration of Yahweh, says, you are my lamp, O Yahweh, and Yahweh makes my darkness light. This was a praise unto Yahweh for a guy that was, you know, at times hiding in caves, evading the attacks of Shaul or even his sons that tried to kill him. And he says that, you know what? Yahweh is my light, lamp. And we understand even in Tehillah 119 that the word of Yahweh is a lamp for our path, a light for our feet. Now, I, I, did, I got it right. A light for our path, a lamp for our feet. There we go. Okay, but they're connected. And I, I did a message many years ago, and I've said it a few times, lamp and light, we need them both. It highlights that they're not two separate entities. We understand the concept. The light is housed from a vessel that's made. So the lamp, as pictured by the menorah, could not shine on the showbread table unless there was oil of pressed olives in the lamps and were trimmed to burn continually. You know, so we understand that the light is the essence, the substance of that which guides us. The lamp is the form which contains the light. So therefore, when our master, the light of the world, came in the form of flesh, he came in many ways to show us how we in these vessels can contain his presence, his spirit, his oil, in order to shine as we should. But we need to make sure that we are trimmed daily, meditating on his Torah day and night. You know, And so when we understand that we have to be urgent in our lives. It's all about being set apart as we guard and keep his feasts. In this dark world, you know, sometimes we may just reflect on how awesome it is. I hope always, but sometimes we just reflect a bit more than others of how awesome it is to delight in Yahweh's Sabbaths and to keep his feasts. Yes, it takes preparation. It takes trimming. It takes uh, uh, diligence. But going through it, there's... There's a, there's a resulting joy that happens teaching us how important it is to guard the feast. You know, when somebody just starts to walk, they don't may necessarily understand the importance of the feast. But every time you go through a cycle, each feast, and you do it again and again, it, get, it hopefully gets solidified in you that there's no other way that you would choose to obey. 
you know. The lamp burning continually teaches us again the idea of light and set-apartness being one that is never separated or divorced from. The Hebrew word continually is tamid, which means continually, all time, constantly, regularly, continually, um, always. 119 verse 44 in Psalm, 119. You must know when I say 119, there's only 119. Hey? Verse 44 says, that I might guard your Torah continually forever and ever. How we keep our lamps burning continually is by guarding his pure and clear Torah day and night because his Torah lights our way. And we are to burn continually. The Hebrew word for burn is Allah, which means to ascend, to climb, to approach. And a derivative of this Allah is the word we get for the Ola offering, which is the whole burnt offering. That's the offering that's put on the slaughter place that's not parts taken from it. It's burnt up wholly. Okay. And the Ola offering speaks of that which ascends and goes up. And it symbolizes complete dedication, a giving of oneself. When I quoted earlier from Romeim 12, our set-apart reasonable worship as a daily living offering, it means you're all, not just parts of you. Because if you give just parts of you, there are times where the lamp is either flickering or out, which could render you as being foolish. So we are to be looking to our master. We are to be celebrating him. You know, one thing that we take note of is just as we are given the understanding of lamp and light, and in the master we understand who we are, we also understand that the enemy has a false light or a false lamp. We're told in Mishle 13 verse 9 that the lamp of the wrong is put out. We're also told in Mishle 24 that there's no future for the evildoer. The lamp of the wrongdoers is put out. So the evildoer is the wrongdoer whose light will be put out. So many people have a counterfeit light. Even Satan himself masquerades as a messenger of light. But that will be put out. And so we understand that we have to guard the truth in our master. Chazon 22 verse 5 says, The night shall be no more. They shall have no need of a lamp or the light of a sun, because Yahweh Elohim shall give them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. This is when the true sons of Elohim are brought forth and revealed that which creation is waiting to happen because it's groaning and waiting to be managed correctly. You know, who among you is fearing Yahweh, obeying the voice of his servant that has walked in darkness and has no light? Let him trust in the name of Yahweh and lean upon his Elohim. See, all you who light a fire, girding on burning arrows, Walk in the light of your fire, and in the light on the burning arrows you have lit. From my hand you shall have this, you shall lie down in grief. These were words from Yeshiyahu 50, and there's a, a clear call here to come back to Yahweh, with a clear warning of those who are not, and those who are putting on a light of their own. You know, as we walk in the Master, we must do our utmost to guard his presence in the seal of his spirit that he's given us and walk daily in this deliverance from darkness that we have received as a gift. When it says here, you know, what it's saying in Yeshua 50, it says, listen, when you try to light your own fire or carry on your own man-made lamp, you're going to get snuffed out. When you're doing things your own way, you're going to have grief because there's going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you're going to be rejected. And this command that we're given in verse 21 of this chapter, you know, we understand that the priest to tend the lamps from evening until morning was a law forever. It tells us how we are to guard ourselves from having our lamps put out. Shoal says in Romans 13, the night is far advanced, the day has come near, so let us put off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. The path of the righteous, favorite passage for many of you, Mishli 4 verse 18, is like the light of dawn, 
that shines ever brighter to the perfect day. That perfect day is when he comes. And we're walking toward that day. Don't step out of line. If your lamps are tended to continually, then that means your eyes are continually fixed on the master. The lamp of the body is the eye. If your eye is good, all your body shall be enlightened. In other words, we spoke again about the deformity of an eye or blindness, you know, and that not looking or being obscured or mixed. If you're consistently looking in the word and at our master, your eye will be good, your body will be enlightened, you'll be vessels unto value. But when you start looking around at all other things and conspiracies and all this other junk and you start mixing and you start going on in all ways, your lamp will not be of value because the light in you will not be good. You know, because our master goes on, he says, but if it's dark, how dark is it inside you? You know, and so we understand that there's a clear picture here that's given to us in verses 10 to 14 about getting rid of the immoral. We must learn to get rid of anything that does not represent Yahweh's set-apartness. Because here we have this child of a mixed marriage, in a sense, because you had a Israeli woman and a, what was it, a, a Mitrian man. And he was blaspheming the name of Yahweh. So they didn't know what to do, so they held him in captivity until Moshe would give a right ruling from Yahweh. And Yahweh said, the one who's blasphemed Yahweh, let him be put to death. You know, when our master was in the flesh and many still couldn't grasp him, he said in Matit Yahu 12, whoever speaks a word against the son of Adam, it shall be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the set-apart spirit shall not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the age to come. We are told to not grieve the set-apart spirit. We're also told in Yochanan there is a sin unto destruction by which you can't be forgiven. And I tie that in about grieving the spirit, blaspheming the, the name of Yahweh. That's, that's a death sentence, you know. He wasn't a child. Yes, sorry, just correct that. He was a grown man, probably the 18-year-old that hadn't moved out yet, you know. <laughs> you know, what we see here is in verse 16, it makes it very clear. He who blasphemes the name of Yahweh shall certainly be put to death. In a Torah portion which is giving us further instructions of who we are in the Master, as a set-apart people, a treasured possession, who are to be guarding set-apartness, the closing verses emphasize the clear witness here that there's always to be right ruling and justice according to the command of Elohim who's in our midst. The command that's given here for I just before I know it's lunchtime, but I want to finish with this. The eye for an eye or a tooth for a tooth. It was not done away with when Yahushua came in the flesh of man. The command speaks of making a right restitution for what's been done. In other words, a fair payment should be given for the loss a victim incur, incurs, 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 incurs from another who harms him and the right compensation that should be given. And I just want to touch on something here because it's very important. If a tooth was lost and the injured could not expect to get more than a tooth's value back. Okay, that's kind of like the, the thing here. You know, people are trying to get more than what they've suffered the loss of. And when Yeshua quoted this verse, he wasn't replacing it, but he was emphasizing it. In Matit Yahu 5, he says, you've heard that it said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the wicked, but whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other cheek to him also. What is he talking about? I hope to expand on this. What's worth taking note of is when Yahushua said, he didn't say it has been written, but he said, you've, you have heard that it was said. And that's a key for us, which implies that he was, he was clearly referring to the attempt of some who were trying to apply this passage when someone offends our pride by teaching us a lesson. A slap on the cheek was often the prerogative of a master or teacher to his servant or student. But, I mean, let's just look at what Scripture says. In Echa or Lamentation 3 verse 30, it says, Let him give his cheek to the one who smites him. He is filled with reproach. Now, what's being said here is that when one is filled with reproach 
and is rebellious, then give your cheek to the one who leads you and teaches you. That's kind of the idea, is submit to their instruction by what they tell you. That's what's being lived out here. What Yeshua was, in essence, quoting from, when he was quoting from the verses in Vayikra 24, and an eye for an eye, it, it did not fit the context or where their eye for an eye and tooth for, the, tooth for a tooth, that what they were trying to present was not fitting the context of rebellion against authority. And a servant could in no way use this eye for an eye concept to get back at their boss or their teacher who disciplined or, or reprimanded them. So what he was saying is just because you've been reprimanded, don't now say, I can retaliate. Because that's not what the eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth was entailing, but they were trying to use it for that. So this is not a time to retaliate and strike back. The correct response would be drop one's offended pride and humbly ask for more teaching so as to be able to understand why the slap came in the first place. Now, I'm saying metaphorically because sometimes people feel like they've been slapped on the cheek because why did you tell me that and they want to retaliate? instead Because they're like naughty, what do you call the terrible twos or the what, the teenagers, rebellious, you know, that kind of thing. This was what Yeshua was addressing was not about compensation for harm or injury. So we get clarity on yet another passage that many have twisted in his day and still do today to fuel their own rebellion against any kind of authority. There's to be one right ruling. There are not different rulings and regulations for different people. It's one Torah for all. So there's only one who gives us law to live by. There's only one who gives us a standard that we are to uphold. And therefore, we don't try and cut corners or excuse wrong actions away. There's one right ruling for the native and the stranger, and it will be like that when he rules and reigns for a thousand years here. So the clear thing that we've been through today is about being set apart. Any thoughts on this passage? That we've just been through, or this Torah portion. Uh, Joshua is saying, Shalom, Shalom, family. Are we still required to wave the sheaf before Yahweh since Messiah waved after the resurrection? When we understand the high priest was the one who waved the sheaf of the first, so we have a high priest who's in the set apart place who has waved that, but when we come to the morrow after the Sabbath during Matzot, we are reminded of the events, and symbolically, we just wave sheaf to remind what took place, but what we do present on that day is our offering of the first of the first, because whenever you come before the master, you don't come empty-handed, but we understand that we are not waving as high priest the sheaf of a harvest, but we do bring the sheaf of the first, because I didn't touch on this, but I'll touch on it briefly now, the First of the first is by belief, because it's before harvest. So one comes to the master with what's in their hand to present, I'm trusting you. I don't know what the harvest is going to bring forth. I don't know what's going to happen. But in belief, I'm bringing this as an offering to you. By the time Shavuot comes, it's a picture of the harvest having been brought in. And you bring of the fruit, the first of that harvest. So before the harvest is even thought of being harvested, one puts trust in Yahweh and saying, I'm, I'm giving this to you. I'm waving this. That's the symbol. By the time Shavuot comes, you come as a produce of that, as a reflection of how he has blessed you. You come to Shavuot, I mean to Sukkot, and again, you come to bless Yahweh according to how he's blessed you because it's always at the end of harvests. So I hope that answers that. We are not waving a resurrection first fruits. We are symbolically waving any in our lives that which is by faith in the master and then Shavuot comes with the waving of the first fruits. It's again that product of a celebration of what's been worked in one's life. The Torah is spiritual. Yeah. We live it out yes. So it has to be a physical and a spiritual. Yes, application. application. And then Gillian, just before we go to lunch, says, isn't it blasphemy to call him God, Lord, Jesus, Holy Spirit? I agree 100%. It is total blasphemy. And on that note, let's have lunch.
Master, Master Yahweh, we bless you and we praise you and we thank you that we can be immersed in your truth that sets us free. We can delight in your word. We thank you that just going through these four chapters, it's just a clear reminder once again of how set apart we are to be. And we get to rehearse that every week, every appointed time in celebration of how you are setting us apart. And so therefore, we desire to be set apart as you are set apart. Teach us, Master Yahweh, to make sure that we cast off all darkness and throw off everything that hinders our walk so that we can cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit and worship you in spirit and in truth. You are our master and we thank you that we can come and share the Sabbath again together in your presence and delight ourselves in your provision. We thank you for the food that we can eat and the homes that are joined with us online. And we pray that you bless each household as you shine your light, the face of your light be upon each and every one of us. As we have this uh, break now and come back into your truth, we thank you for your perfect provision in the name of Yahushua, our Messiah. Amen. Amen.